Well, welcome. <laughs> Chris, the people from Atlanta are the only ones first time and we have a pretty exciting meeting planned. Uh, I was gonna start out with some things. First, we're gonna go, gonna talk a little bit about Carl is having a talk on Saturday. Carl, do you mind uh, taking the floor and telling a little bit about your talk? I'm going to spotlight you, if that's Hello. okay. Yeah, I would say that uh, um, it's, it's more gonna be just going over the basics of, of the stereo window and how to adjust it. So I would say that if you're an experienced, I understand that there was some other 3D meeting going on at the same time. Um, I don't know anything about it, but um, uh, I would suggest that if you've got a, a firm grip on the stereo window, you probably don't need to sit through my class. However, um, I'll be going over a Stereo Photo Maker and a Stereoid, Stereoid Pro um, on how to set the window and just sort of different techniques for making sure that you've got it right. Is that so I3D it. Stereoid Pro? Yes. The one on the. So there you go. You can <laughs> be in your stereo window like this. Yeah, Not I recommend. That I Everybody Not that I'm using this as a visual aid, but anyway. So yeah, that'll be Saturday morning, 10 o'clock. I don't think it's going to run for 90 minutes. It'll probably run for, I'm thinking no more than 45. Okay, here's the uh, information on it. Same, same channel as here. We're going to have Carl give a talk. We'll also probably have the... Uh, preview video of the 3D con if people are interested. We usually like to run that early on. So 3D con this year is August 12th through 15th. It's going to be virtual again. It was going to be in New Mexico. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we decided it would be better to have it virtually again this year. Next year, I believe it's going to be in the Seattle Tacoma area as planned for the year before. <coughs> Sorry. Today I'm going to go, we're going to go over a lot of traditional stuff. Eric's going to talk about one of the first things we're going to have is somebody developing a tin type. We'll have way more detail on that later. Uh, Eric, are you recording the meeting? Yes, I am. Great. So I'm going to show a screen and one of the things that I'm going to share is some pictures that were taken when I was a, not even an idea in my dad's head, hopefully. Uh, these pictures were taken, I think in 1930, and they were of my father and his family. Uh, they were taken in their home. And what the deal was, let me uh, share the first one. Need to Steve, stop we're still sharing. seeing your browser. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stop share and then I'm going to share again. Now, hopefully, you guys have parallel viewers or anaglyph glasses. So I'll give you a little time to put those on. That's my father and his sister. And these photographs were taken by the Keystone View Company. And what their deal was, my family lived in Ohio. Uh, my grandfather was born there and uh, his parents were from Indiana, but they were lived in a little town in Ohio and the <clears throat> town was near, fairly near Cleveland, a little past Cleveland, between Cleveland and Toledo, it was called Norwalk. So it was a, not a large town at the time now it's growing pretty fast, so it's a lot bigger now than it was even when I lived there. So this is a first picture. What they would do is a salesman would come and write you by letter before they came into the town and they'd say, hey, would you like to buy a tour of the world set? If you buy the tour of the world set, we'll go take pictures of your family. And my father remembers this. He's the one on the right, that's his sister. And they took uh, five to seven pictures of the family. 
And then they also got a stereoscope and a tour of the world set. So when I was a kid, I remember going to visit my grandparents and in their closet, along with a Mahjong set, it was real ivory, it was a stereoscope with tons of views. And I used to go and uh, look at the views whenever I came to visit, which was several times a week since we were walking distance from my grandparents. So my grandfather <clears throat> was kind of into 3D and this was during the depression. So this would have been 29 or 1930 when these pictures were taken. And the person who was living there with them was my, his cousin, my dad's cousin, who's from England. And they had to move from England to the US during the depression because they couldn't make any money. And they were living with my family along with another family at the time because my family apparently was the only one that was doing well. They lived in rural Ohio and they had lived there for generations and uh, had a lot of land and were doing pretty well at the time. So, and the funny thing is how I got into 3D had nothing to do with these pictures. These pictures were given to me long after I was into 3D. I vaguely remember them, but I got into 3D because I was a molecular biologist and uh, we had to view all the things in 3D then. And that was in the late seventies. So that's kind of what got me interested. And then I got interested in it again in the nineties and joined NSA. And then it was actually after that that they sent me these views. And then I was showing them to my aunt that was from England who also moved to California and her husband used to be a camera salesman and he just happened to have an unused brand new stereo colorist too in his closet and he gave me that. So I guess it was fate. So this is one picture. Hey Steve. Yeah. Your the the family resemblance to your father is striking. Yeah, my son looks exactly like me. So. Oh. Yeah, he, he he looks so much like you there. Okay, so I'll go over these first as uh, side by side. If anybody wants to see them as anaglyphs, I'll show them as that afterwards. It's another wow. picture of him and his sister. The funny thing is, her name was Evelyn Berzin, and their cousin was also named Evelyn Berzin. And were, they were actually close, but since they were born the same, basically the same week, the families communicated by letters, they hadn't known that she had named her the same name. And so they were both named Devil and Bears. And the other one's quite famous for inventing the word processor. So we had a lot of jokes. If you ever Google Bears in, before she died, which was about a year ago, you would always get my site. And then since she was so famous for inventing the word processor, she got, she bumped me. And I know she'd be quite happy about that. She, she wanted my site. She was always trying to buy it from me. This is my grandfather and my dad, my aunt and my grandmother. And that was a piano. That piano is actually made in my hometown. A.B. Chase, very well-known piano, <clears throat> if you're a piano player. And this was their house they owned for a while, and then they bought another house that was right next door. This is uh, another shot of them. It doesn't get much more exciting. They weren't the most... Uh, they must have had to sit still. My dad still remembers it. And the funny thing is, if you went to NSA a lot, especially in Charleston, my dad actually did uh, sit at my table and sold stuff. So he did work. He knew Ray Zone and uh, Charlie Van Pelt fairly well for meeting them at the meetings in the 90s. I think this is the last picture. 
And I remember this house very well because, uh, and the furniture. These things just never seem to change at that city. Anybody wants to see a mananoglyph? Anybody? Yep. Yes, please. Yes, please. Steve, have you put these online anywhere? Do you have an album? No. Like no, I'm a little worried about putting them online. I did look for them at the uh, Riverside Museum. And one thing, I did do some research when the new thing came out, uh, the Keystone. And the guy, the photographer is William Codwell, who's a Keystone photographer. We could tell from the letters that was who did it. And he was actually in the area at the time to photograph a flower show in uh, Cleveland. It's a huge flower show. So that's, we, he probably sent them a letter and said he was going to be in town. And this is a one in a lifetime opportunity. And they didn't do this very often. They didn't shoot a lot of families. But what they did have when they did move from Pennsylvania, the collection out to California, they didn't save very many because. You know, it was just a lot of weight. They were glass negatives and they really weren't of historic interest. I'm sure they were all kind of the same kind of boring. If you notice in the back of this, there's a very uh, uh, old set of world books. And uh, we got inherited those when we were kids. And my mom looked at them and found that they were complimentary of the Ku Klux Klan and promptly threw them out. So it was a green collection of the, I guess in 1911, uh, that was okay. So were these Keystone cards one-offs or did they make any duplicates? No, they were just one-offs. I mean, they might've made duplicates. I don't know why they would, but uh, we do, I did get a copy uh, John Waltzmith sent me a copy of the salesman's manual. So this was something that they did. They would go to sell more of the views. They would go to families and uh, offer to, to give them a few pictures of the family as well. So, and we, I do have movies, a later meeting, I'll see if I can find them. And they're of the family during my parents engagement party and they're looking at these old views. So they it's something that our family did a long time. And another thing when my father before World War II, you know, he knew he was going into World War II in the Navy, he took a wild trip out west. And everywhere he stopped, he picked up a true he would, must have been kind of into view 3D because we found a whole collection of true view strips after he died, he liked the true view. They were all of cities between uh, Ohio and uh, California. Oops. That's it. It's so great that you still have these. Yeah, they look just like regular Keystone cards. They're curved. So, yeah, you're lucky to have these. The, the only ones like this I've seen, uh, mm -hmm. Suzanne Lloyd, Harold Lloyd, if you're rich enough, I guess, uh, you you could hire them to come out and you know take pictures like this. And uh, Suzanne Lloyd has a whole bunch of the Harold Lloyd family back at you know the 1930s. And I, we also years ago met the son of Bob Brost, who worked for, I think he worked for Keystone for a while. And uh, he had personal pictures that were on Keystone mounts curved and everything like this. But I haven't, I've seen very few of, you know, this type of thing of families that are, you know, not commercial ones that were sold to the public. Yeah, it's kind of weird. No, I think it's pretty cool. You're you're very lucky to have these. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to ask you, Dave. You did you say it already? Are those cards curved or are they flat? Yeah, they are curved. They're yeah, definitely they, oh. curved. Other than the fact that they don't have printing on them, they look just like the classic 
gray keystone cards. That's fantastic. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. definitely curved. And I do have uh, maybe a later meeting, I'll show one of the uh, curved, uh, how they curve them. I did get a picture of that machinery when I was at the Keystone Museum. Yeah. How they, an actual press, they actually used a press to curve them. And the reason is still controversial, but I think, and a few other people think the reason they did them is so they wouldn't, they put them in big stacks so they wouldn't fall over. Yeah, that's what oh, they told me when I visited the museum. Huh. Yeah, if you ever get a chance, visit that museum in uh, Riverside. It's in, no, this is no, in Pennsylvania. No, no, it, it, it's oh. in, it's, yeah, in Eastern Pennsylvania. Oh, that Mead, one. Or, Meadville. Yeah. I'm sorry, what, Western Western Pennsylvania. Mead, yeah. Meadville. In Meadville. Meadville, Meadville yes. that's it. Western Pennsylvania. And it's, um, oh, what's the name of the museum? It's the uh, Johnson Shaw Museum. Johnson Shaw Museum. Yeah. Right. And if you're um, nice to yeah. them, they'll let you, uh, they'll open it even if it's closed. I, I arranged for it. And... Yeah. Uh, they, so the they curve have, on uh, those was intentional. I never knew that. Yes. Yeah. The curve was it intentional. Definitely was. They, they, they explained it. They explained it to me as uh, it was kind of like Pringles potato chips. They wanted the stacks. Uh, they needed to be able to stack them and not have them slide off the stack. Yeah, they don't, they don't slide. And they're all the same curve. It's not by chance. It's a real yeah. mold, yeah. just a wooden press. Hmm. Yeah, I, I had heard two other theories as to why they were curved. So that's interesting. Well, it could be another one, but I'm pretty sure it's that stack thing. Yeah. Well, one one was that uh, it would reduce glare when you're looking at them, uh, and another one was they felt that it it added somehow to the depth to have the curve. <laughs> but uh, at to, at the uh, museum, he the curator there uh, pretty much dispelled those as as not the reasons. Yeah. Okay. Um, and 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 he's he was uh, I believe third generation working for the Keystone Company. Oh, that was Johnson. Yeah, he was yeah, a yeah yeah yeah. He was a radio yeah. broadcaster. I and think. I'm sure you've got the right reason, and and that's really yeah. interesting about the stacking. There are also idiots who make curved TVs too. <laughs> they don't stack okay. those. They don't make them for the same reason. Oh, I stacked them. <laughs> well, good for you, Lee. <laughs> I think that's. I think we've seen this one already. Am I? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think, you, I think you've gone yeah. all the way around. Gone through. I through. think we're done here. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Steve. These these were great. Thanks for sharing. But, uh, them. What I'll try to do is find the video of us watching them at some point. I think uh, Eric, you mentioned you have an eight millimeter uh, digitizer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I love that. Maybe you could loan that to me sometime and I'll digitize it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks, Steve. It's up to, Eric's going to introduce our next guest. Okay. And... Yeah, yeah. We, we have a, uh, a special guest with us tonight from uh, New York. I'm doing... Okay. <laughs> there he is. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Sam. Hello, Sam. There I am. Sam Dole. Sam Dole uh, works at the Penumbra Foundation in New York. They are a, mm -hmm. a nonprofit organization dedicated to antiquated photographic techniques and keeping them alive and teaching them to people. Uh, Sam does workshops and courses there um, at the Penumbra Foundation, and we've invited him tonight to give a demonstration on how to do wet plate tintype stereo photography. Excellent. Thank you so much for the introduction, Eric, and thank you for having me. Um, I just want to start things out um, by just giving you guys a little bit of information about the Number Foundation and what we do and what we're about. So as Eric mentioned, we are a nonprofit arts and education organization, um, primarily workshop based as far as um, how we engage with the public. Uh, we teach workshops in just about any historic photographic process that has taken place all the way from daguerreotype all the way up through, well, if it happened in the past 160 years of photography, we teach it here. 
daguerreotype, calotype, wet plate collodion, uh, which is thin type is a component of that, uh, albumin printing, salt printing, platinum printing, again, you name it, we teach it here. Uh, we also have a artist in residence program. We have rental darkroom facilities. We have a rental uh, north facing skylight studio, which is a lovely thing. Uh, we have a lecture series that is currently online. If you go on our website or on our Instagram page, you can see some more information about that. We're adding new lecturers all the time. Um, trying to think of what else. We have a research library, which we may show off later on if uh, time permitting. And um, yeah, we have a lot going. And of course, we have a Tintype portrait studio in-house, which uh, not a lot of people have. <laughs> um, but the Tintype studio, it's, it's sort of, as we call it, the tail wagging the dog. It's what kind of gives people, a lot of people, a taste for historic processes and engaging with those processes who otherwise would not have about them or perhaps not been interested in them. And so um, that's the part of what I'm gonna show you today. I'm gonna give you a taste of a type of photography you probably have not seen demonstrated or uh, perhaps didn't know uh, about uh, before. Um, you know, I also would be remiss to say uh, if uh, that, uh, you know, as a nonprofit organization, especially in the trying times of COVID. Uh, we are primarily uh, membership funded and um, revenue funded. So if you uh, enjoy what you see and you like what we do, I encourage you to look at our programming online. I know you guys are mostly out in the West Coast, but um, I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit later about some things that you can participate in uh, remotely. Um, and I'm sure Alicia would just, also like I've to. Just, I've just put the link to Penumbra in the chat as well. So if people want to visit the website, the link is available. Right. Much appreciated. Thank you very much, Eric. And Alicia would also, I'm sure, like me to point out the fact that I'm, in addition to being uh, the official ambassador for Penumbra tonight, I'm also Alicia's boyfriend. Husband. Husband <laughs> to be. So there you go. She will also be my lovely subject this evening. And I also have a couple of friends here who were so kind as to join me, Carlos and Sabrina over here. Carlos is going to be my trusty camera man, and Sabrina is going to be a trusty moral support. <laughs> um, so anyhow, um, it's going to be a lot of yapping for a little bit, but I'll try to keep things interesting. Um, just to give a little bit of background on my background in... Um, in uh, wet plate collodion and photography in general. So I, um, my father is also a photographer, a commercial photographer, did tabletop still life uh, here in New York City for about 25 years, uh, born and raised here. Um, I have a lot of other family members involved in the arts, involved in photography, particularly in commercial arts and TV and advertising and things like that. Uh, I went to school of visual arts, uh, got my BFA in photography there. Uh, as for Tin type and historic processes, that was kind of something I learned out on my own. And I've been doing this process now, uh, tin types, for uh, going on 12 years. And uh, to clarify some terminology, tin type is a form of wet plate collodion photography. So, wet plate collodion is the overarching uh, technique that we're talking about. Um, it was invented in 1851 in England by Frederick Scott Archer, and it was originally conceived of as a method of making glass negatives. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and poke around here, and I'm gonna show you guys something a little more interesting besides my big old face for a change. And I'm gonna see, do I have a glass negative handy here? I believe I do. So in its original inception, wet plate collodion was conceived of as a method of making negatives, which you could make a print from. So if we hold this glass negative, it's an emulsion on glass, up to white, it appears as a negative. However, if we back it against something dark, we can see it appears positive. And now this is sort of a thin negative as density is concerned. I don't know how much of our audience, I imagine just about everyone here has some familiarity with the black and white dark room or is taken pictures with film at some point or another. And I'm sure at some point or another, we've all underexposed our film by a factor of many stops. Perhaps we've accidentally 
left our meters set at uh, you know ASA 400 when we have you know 100 speed film loaded. Uh, so the effect of backing a underexposed negative with something dark is what gives us the illusion of a positive. So again, in its original inception, this process was conceived of for making prints from these glass negatives. At the time, you would have seen, and I'm sure all the stereo card collectors amongst you, if you collect 19th century stereo cards, those would be albumin prints. Those would be albumin prints mounted on uh, a piece of cardstock. And let me see, oh, I have some over here. And there you go, again, this is more likely than not old hat for just about everyone here. This is actually a very lovely specimen here. If we look up close at it, this is actually a spirit photograph. We can see an angel, uh, alleged angel, poking its way into the frame there. And um, so, yeah, so that was the printing method that was kind of mated to wet plate collodion, was albumin printing. And it was later conceived of for making positives backed with black um, called ambrotype. So that would be a glass positive. Um, made with wet plate collodion. And they were typically clear glass that was lacquered black behind them. Uh, black glass was not very common in the 19th century. Glass as a whole was very expensive as a commodity in the 19th century. And so finally, I believe it was around 1856, was the first American patent for the tin type, which was a direct positive on metal. And it held many advantages over ambrotypes and daguerreotypes, which had preceded them. They were inexpensive, they were durable, you could carry them around in your pocket without the need for having any kind of casing or protective um, what have you. And uh, yeah, that was sort of the selling point of that process. And it was really the predominant form of photography from 1851 till about the turn of the century when dry emulsions, such as you know, dry plates, you know, silver gelatin emulsion on glass came into production and came into popularity. You also saw the introduction of flexible roll film in 1888 from George Eastman, uh, which would go on to Kodak as a company. And uh, wet plate collodion kind of started to rescind in terms of its commercial viability. Uh, it was still practiced somewhat in somewhat itinerant fashion. Um, as sort of a boardwalk and midway attraction. It was uh, popular at seaside carnivals and things like that. Anything w involving souvenir photography in which you needed a direct positive image and a final product in the customer's hand in an expedient amount of time. And you're gonna see that when I demonstrate the process here, um, and you can see over here, this is my setup. Uh, some modern contrivances are a bit anachronistic to the time period, but uh, you know we're in the 21st century, so we're gonna take advantage of all the conveniences that uh, I see fit to make, uh, to make our process easier. We're using artificial light, strobe lighting, uh, electronic flash, as opposed to natural light, which uh, would be impossible uh, given, uh, given the, the time zone that I'm on over here. Um, but uh, yeah, um, you're gonna see that the process itself is in fact very quick from start to finish. The time to pose the subject, the time to get the composition right, to get all of that correct, to get the lighting right. That's what takes the time. But really, the process from start to finish is quite quick. Uh, you could sort of think of it almost as a 19th century Polaroid, uh, if you wanted to uh, define it in those terms. Um, so real quick, uh, before we get to the stereo camera setup and so getting the... Um, getting my composition together with my lovely subject this evening. I just want to show everybody sort of our workhorse camera for the studio. So this is what would be a more typical studio camera rig for a 19th century, or in this case, 21st century, um, tintype portrait studio. Uh, the camera itself is more of a turn of the century kind of setup. It's uh, functionally the stand that it's on, and just the general mechanics of the camera is about identical to what you would have in the 19th century towards the latter half of the 19th century. It just so happens, incidentally, this is a um, post-wet plate era camera. But again, functionally identical. Uh, we focus on a ground glass on the back, which I'll show you guys on the stereo camera. We don't have to go uh, belabor the, the two-dimensional elements of photography here, which we're not here to discuss. 
Uh, although I would say of interest is the lens here. We're a very lens-centric uh, group here at Penumbra. Um, I myself collect a lot of historic photographic lenses, primarily large format. Um, but this is a lens made by J.H. Dahlmeyer of, um, of London. They were a very popular um, maker, manufacturer of particularly portrait lenses, as the Petzval portrait lens, uh, which was at the time one of the fastest lenses available uh, for portraiture. Uh, and this was a major asset at the time because photographic emulsions, wet by collodion being the one we're discussing here, were very slow. Uh, when we talk about our film or our digital sensors or film speed ratings, you know, we're used to shooting ISO or ASA if you're old school, 100, 400. Uh, this process has an effective speed rating, if you were to rate it, of about one to three. That's the single digit there. So it calls for a lot of light. So these lenses were very fast for the time period. Typical lenses prior to the invention of the Petzval lens were typically in the order of F13. So you can imagine F13 with nothing but natural light at your disposal is going to be a very long exposure. This lens is F3, so many, many, many times faster. It's from about 1870 or so, it's called the Dahlmeyer 3B patent portrait lens. And this is probably one of the most popular lenses for most formats in wet plate collodion, ranging from really four by five to five by seven. Some people stretch this out to eight by 10 as far as uh, the coverage of the lens goes. I personally find that this focal length of lens, which is about 300 millimeters, is a more pleasing perspective for smaller formats, but some people like to stretch it out to larger ones. Anyway, getting a little bit uh, besides myself here, as far as, uh, as far as cameras and lenses go, I could go down a deep rabbit hole there. But uh, without further ado, I think um, it's a good point in time now to get our stereo set up together. Uh, and hold on just a moment, folks. Great, we're, we're doing the thing. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so first things first, we wrangle our subject, which is the, 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 the most involved component of this. And uh, so secondly, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys the camera that we're gonna be using to make this, um, to make our portrait this evening. So this camera, again, not of the time period necessarily, but uh, functionally, it does what we need to do. This is a Graflex graph stereographic, which uh, comes equipped with a focal plane shutter, which we are not making use of for our purposes. Uh, you're gonna see when I make the exposure that uh, we use the shutter at the end of my hand here, which is simply to remove the lens cap from the lenses um, that we're gonna be using here. And you'll, you'll see when we get the lighting uh, set up together and going, the mechanics of how that works is actually quite simple. But uh, in any case, um, this camera probably dates from about, if I had to put a guess on it, perhaps, early 1920s, uh, stereo equipped Graflex cameras are very uncommon. Uh, they did not particularly uh, survive the test of time as the popularity of stereo was concerned at the time period relative to the professional market for their cameras, which was typically for journalists and people who uh, reported the news and, 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 and whatnot. Uh, one of the ingenious things about the design of this camera uh, that I'd love to point out to everybody is so if we look at the inside here, when we look at the septum, it's actually a thin piece of rubberized cloth that can move in tur turn with the bellows, with the extension of them, and it can move and retract in accordance with how close you're focused or the focal length of your lens. Now, I will say that time has not been kind to this rubberized cloth and uh, it tends to want to bunch up at the back here. So I may, at one point or another, have to remove the lens from the camera and kind of gather that cloth back together, depending on how close or far away I'm focused. So you'll have to, you'll have to bear with me on that. But, you know, that's the, uh, the trials and tribulations of using, uh, was it, 110-year-old pieces of equipment like they were brand new. Um, so probably of greater interest to everyone here, including uh, particularly this crowd, or the lenses I'm gonna be using. So I'll probably be using the shorter of these two focal lengths in all likelihood, but this is a matched sequential 
um, sequential uh, serial number pair of Petzval portrait lenses. Um, so to call these rare would be the understatement of the century. Uh, they are rare enough as single lenses, let alone as uh, stereo pairs. And they are matched just about perfectly in terms of focal length and in terms of uh, and in terms of uh, just the precision of how they're made. Uh, anybody here that has shot any kind of homebrew camera, let alone large format, let alone something that is um, again something in which you have to purchase the lenses separately, no, finding sequential ser serial numbers of lenses out in the wild is not an easy task. Uh, and certainly when you're talking about 19th century lenses such as these, all these lenses were ground by hand. They were made by hand. So it's that much more critical that the serial numbers be sequential because you got to remember that would dictate the, the person who is sitting there at the bench grinding the lenses that day is what would dictate exactly how precise the curvature and how matched they are optically. Um, and these are made by a manufacturer I'm truthfully not that familiar with. It is a company called CJ Fox. Uh, I'm un it's unclear to me if that is a manufacturer or perhaps a dealer's name. Oftentimes, the individual camera seller or equipment seller or dealer would engrave their personal business name on the lens in, uh, in lieu of or in addition to the manufacturer of the lens itself. Um, also worth knowing that this lens is made in New York, New York City, uh, for that matter, not upstate, not Rochester, where Kodak and any number of other uh, companies eventually settled down. Um, I'll probably this evening be using the shorter focal length here. Um, these lenses are made or imported, I should say, by Benjamin French and Company, uh, which was an importer out of Boston. But I, I happen to know for a fact that they imported primarily um, Darlow, which was incidentally a French brand of, uh, of um, lens and a French manufacturer of lenses. Uh, they also made a lot of lenses for magic lanterns, uh, projectors, which uh, many of you were probably familiar with. But anyhow, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get the lens mounted on my camera here. And I'm going to turn the camera duties over to Carlos, who's going to be so kind as to keep the camera on me, and Alicia as well, who is going to be so kind who's going to be so kind as to sit down and not move for a whole as long as it takes uh so anyhow we're going to mount the lenses up now we have interchangeable lenses here and again the, i mean these lenses are probably from about mm, if i had to put a date on it just based on the cosmetics of the design of these lenses probably about mm, 18, I'd say probably about 1860. These are pretty early in design as far as Petzval lenses are concerned. Also worth noting that you'll notice that these lenses do not have diaphragms. They don't have an iris. Uh, the method by which lenses were stopped down at the time prior to the invention of iris diaphragms was with these little devices here called Waterhouse Stops, named after the, uh, the first name of the gentleman who invented them escaped me. But his last name was Waterhouse. And they are these little circular cutout pieces of metal, of flat metal here, that would slide into this little slot at the top of the lens here. And that's how you would stop your lens down. Now, we're going to be using this lens wide open. Um, these lenses are probably at about, most Petzval lenses are about f3.5 to f3.8. A lot of the smaller ones tend to be around f4 or slower even, uh, which is just about where I want to be as far as the exposure uh, that we're going to be working with is concerned. If we take a look at our lighting setup here, so one of the modern contrivances that we have at our disposal is studio uh, strobes and flash. Uh, and again, bearing in mind the fact that this process is very, 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 very insensitive to light relative to film and to digital sensors, we need a lot of power. Uh, I don't know how many people here are familiar or not with studio strobe lighting and equipment, but we're using a uh, minimum 4,000 watt seconds, which is the way in which studio strobes are rated of power. There's some older Norman uh, strobes, which are kind of tended to be um, 
of a lot of uh, portrait studios, the you know, Sears portrait studio and places like that. Um, but they're excellent for our purposes. Uh, and just for context, as far as power rating goes, the flash on your camera, if you have, say, a DSLR with a little pop-up flash, is about 40 watt seconds. So this is 100 times more power, at full power, mind you, um, in order to get an exposure. So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So if my subject would be so kind as to sit down and uh, in the hot seat here, should also point out, so this is, again, a bit of an anachronism given the fact that we are going to be stopping action with the power of the flash here. That's the beauty of using strobe light is that we don't have to have our subject stand still for a grueling period of time. Um, typical exposures in a skylight studio in the 19th century would probably be in the order of anywhere from 10 seconds to 15 seconds, potentially more. Again, you're dependent on the time of day, of the weather, of any number of extenuating factors there. But with the power of flash, we don't have to worry about that. Um, it is worth noting that, uh, and as somebody pointed out, uh, yes, Magnesium flash did come into usage, typically more for outdoors situations than, uh, than anything. Uh, they didn't tend to, it, they would sometimes be used indoors, although I will say most of, like when you see an old timey movie with magnesium flash going off, that's usually more of the dry plate era, uh, not so much in wet plate era. Carbon arc light did come into use towards the lattermost half of the 19th century. Um, it's alluded to in a number of historic manuals that I've read about, but again, uh, predating the mainstream implementation of electricity in, uh, in major cities and certainly well outside of, okay, this is not going to work. You don't like the P-pad? It's not, it's the P-pad doesn't like our, our, our yeah. setup. Then you're just going to eat the piece, excellent. So, um, uh, so that being, uh, that being said, um, Electronic lighting and electric flash was not really implemented in studios until well after the uh, the wet plate era, at least as a commonplace thing. Um, so, if you had a subject that refused to sit still for more than five seconds, you would because because you're my favorite. Um, you would uh, go ahead and use some kind of implement to keep them still. So this, believe it or not, is what would actually be used. This is called a neck brace or head brace. There's a lot of weird infighting in the wet plate community about what's the proper terminology. It's a head brace. No, it's a neck brace. It's a keeps you the hell still brace. That's all I care about. <laughs> um, I will say that this one is, in fact, a reproduction. These are exceedingly rare. Uh, we do have some actual 19th century neck braces working around here. And later on, when we go into the library, uh, I'm going to show you guys some examples of those. Um, but these were exceedingly rare. Most of these were melted down for scrap iron around World War I when it became very much uh, unpopular and out of vogue to have an old contraption like this in your studio. Uh, but even with the usage of flash lighting, it's, a, it's a still a nice thing to have just to keep the position of your subject uh, in between focusing, doing your darkroom work, and then bring the plate back out to expose. Uh, because as with anything in photography, the larger your format, uh, the shallower your depth of field at a given aperture. So at F4 on, we're gonna be shooting a five by seven format here in stereo. Um, the depth of field is very, very shallow. So in order to even just to keep the position of your focus in between loading the plate and uh, making the exposure, this is just a helpful thing to have at your disposal. Uh, Sabrina, could you be so kind as to switch off that light over there? We're going to kill our house lights and we're going to turn on a modeling light on our flash here. So we're going to go ahead and get our subject posed. So, so we have some props here. So what are we going to be doing with our props? Excellent. Three, three dimensions of banana. I like it. Uh, so I'm going to do a little art direction here. So we're just going to pull your hat back far, and we're just you're going to want to have your chin up for me, just so it doesn't block the light. Oh, is that your better side? No. Oh. Yeah, no. The sacrifice is made for art. Okay. So get about into rough position here, and then Carlos, if you're going to come back around and take a look, 
this is the fun part here. So I don't know if there are folks here who have not seen, uh, who have perhaps not seen uh, the back of a view camera before our large format camera, but you'll notice the image is upside down. It is also backwards. All images form upside down and backwards. Uh, this happens in, uh, this is just a effect of how lenses work. It's also, it's just how optics work in general. Our eyeballs form images upside down and backwards and our brain flips it the right side up. Uh, but you know, when we're dealing with large format cameras, we're effectively just dealing with a light type box. Uh, again, there's, we're not even working with the shutter in the camera. We're basically just using it as a chamber for light. And so when we look at it here, you know, uh, yeah, actually your, your profile looks really nice from back here. So maybe let's do something in profile. What do we think of that? All right. So I'm going to pull back just a little bit here. And then we're going to get our subject into focus. So you know what we'll do is let's turn you your body kind Ow. of free. Oh, sorry. Alicia just got her COVID vaccine, and uh, I touched her right what where, so right where, are, I know, it's right where she got poked in. So you know. <laughs> so here, so hold like that, and turn your head for me this way, and you'll have your uh, you'll be looking through through the stereoscope at the banana, yeah. And all right, so we're going to bring Alicia into focus here. Just like that. And I think, okay, so the, I might have to make a little adjustment so you can see that there's a little bit of vignetting from that septum flexible thingamajig, but we might just go ahead with it. Again, it's one of the, one of the perks of using antiquated equipment, it has antiquated equipment problems, but we have a, we have a popular say, we have a popular saying at Penumbra here, we fight the war with the army we have. And you know, another very important thing, especially with large format stereo and large format anything, is to get our camera nice and level. It's also very important to keep the camera as square to the subject as possible. Doing a pretty good job at. So we're still getting some of the lovely details of Alicia's talk over here. And let's go ahead and I'm just gonna go ahead and get the head brace vaguely into position here. Neck brace, as it were. And Eileen. Hmm, I haven't heard that term before. Very interesting. I, um, and you know, one thing I should clarify is as much as this looks like some kind of torture device, it's really just designed to just barely rest against the base of your neck. It's not, you know, a lot of people have this conception that you're just gonna clamp around your head and it's really just to hold the position ever so slightly and just kind of bear the weight of, um, oh shoot, I think that my ear pods just died. Let me. Hold on. Sorry. Bear with us for just a moment as Sam changes his battery. Thanks, Eric. Go to the concession stand. Yeah, time to pop up a thing of butter popcorn. Well, I, I see in the chat, uh, Gordon noted that the back of the camera can actually be cross viewed. And yeah, that, that's correct. And in fact, the, uh, the tintype, once it's printed, uh, will be in a cross view format. I think that's true with all cameras. Uh, well, we, yeah, with, with, them. with, with uh, uh, stereo cameras, if you've got parallel lenses, because the images are flipped upside down. Uh, in the clutch, indeed. Flip the camera. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. So, you know, it, 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 there is nothing more infuriating than when the 19th century technology is the thing that is working most nice. efficiently and the phone is the thing that gives me the most problems. 
it's like the story of my life. Anyway, that being said, so we're going to go ahead and place this at three. If you could be so kind, to just put your phone. Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you, but we don't see you. So this is just going to kind of keep. Sam, we can we can hear you, but we don't see you. Oh wait, Sam. I think they said that they can hear. So we switched over to my phone. If, okay, um, uh, if they can pin me, uh, Carlos Becerra, yeah. I have the video up. Ah, uh, okay. We were just having some see, technical difficulties with Sam's phone. Got it. Let me find you, Carlos. There you are. Okay, I'm going to spot look, spotlight Carlos. And we oh, are back. Excellent. Okay, we're, okay back. we're back. Thank Sorry you. about that. Yeah, if you want to if you want to go over your spiel of the uh, <laughs> the 19th century technology working and the uh, the 21st century. <laughs> yes, I, I think you get to say how many times that, that has plagued me in my life. But uh, in any case, we are back. We are back. We're doing it live. Right, so do we have that? My banana's good. Banana's good. Okay, so uh, hold that up and let's get <laughs> here. And we're just gonna check our focus. And we check our focus a few times throughout the course of this process. This is just our preliminary focusing and then we're gonna get into the dark room and do our work in there. And uh, okay, so why don't you angle, I know it's not, Correct, we have an angle of the viewer a little bit more towards me, uh, a little more, a little further away. Because if you're a little too close, and again, you can see how, because of how shallow the depth of field is, the viewer, when it's too close to the camera, is going to appear more or less completely out of focus. Here, here's the idea. Why don't I have to stem on this side and just hold it? Because I guarantee you, is going to fall out. I'll hold my banana. Hold the banana down. Okay, thank you. There we go. And so, so we're going to hold it like so. That's excellent. And angle it a little more there. All right. There we go. That's excellent. And one last thing just before we go into the dark room. But as I said before, you're going to find that the dark room process is, is in fact very quick. It's the fastest element of the process. This is what takes the time setting up the camera, setting up lighting, the subject correct, getting our accoutrements correct. So I'm just going to fill in a little bit of light with this reflector here. Um, one of the major idiosyncrasies of this process is that it is orthochromatic. And for those unfamiliar with that term, that means it is primarily sensitive towards the blue end of the spectrum and insensitive largely towards the red end of the spectrum. The blue sensitivity extends even into the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. Um, and uh, so it's very important they have a very UV rich source of light. Uh, a lot of older flash units distributors actually put out a lot more UV light than modern flash, which is going to be advantage to in that way. Uh, okay, so we're about blocked out compositionally, and we, we always check our focus, we recheck before um, for actually making the exposure. But uh, I'd say we're about 90% of the way there. So now we're going to go ahead and go into the dark room, and Carlos is going to open come with me in here. So this is the dark room that we work out of. And I know what you're probably thinking. And the answer is yes, you do have to bring a dark room with you if you do this process outside of the studio. And we have all sorts of portable contrivances for doing that little sort of pop up tents, kind of a stationary thing that I stand at. It's not a walk in tents necessarily. I've worked out of those before. And I prefer traveling light. But uh, I'm by and large a studio photographer, so this is this this is my office, as it were. Um, people sometimes use vans as well, right? Oh yeah, people work out of vans. I mean, that's sort of you know the wet white wagon is kind of like the 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 uh, you know the the you know the every wet white photographer's dream. It's like I can't I can't pass by like a van or a Winnebago on the street without thinking, man, it's so cool to wet white. <laughs> so first things first, I'm gonna scrub up. Put my gloves here because as you see also the apron is not just for fashion, it is functional. Uh, the chemicals involved in this process will stain 
a lot of things, including skin, including eyeballs. So I'm going to practice due diligence and put all my safety glasses. Let's keep them on top of my head for now. Um, to start out with, um, this is the plate itself. So it is a, um, a black enameled sheet of anodized aluminum, but we're using the black side of it. So this is sort of a modern um, uh, implementation here. Uh, apart from the studio light, this is the only other modern element of what we're doing here. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, tin types were made on thin sheets of iron that were lacquered with powdered asphalt uh, that was baked on um, to the surface of the plate. Uh, tin types were never made on tin. That is a fact you can take to the bank 110%. Never made on tin. If everybody suffers a collective amnesiac moment tonight and you forget everything I've taught you, if there's one thing I hope you remember, tin types, never made on tin. They were never made on tin and do not let anybody try to convince you otherwise. They were always made on thin sheets of iron. Uh, the original name for the tin type was ferrotype, uh, as in alluding to ferrous metal, iron-based metal. Um, however, uh, ferrotype plates, tin type plates, were they were a commercially manufactured product in the 19th century. Um, it was not something that a photographer would make themselves. Uh, I have made ferrotype plates, the traditional method before, and uh, I don't particularly recommend doing it uh, to anybody who's interested in learning how to do this process themselves. Uh, it's a very toxic process to uh, make the plates. You kind of have to, you have to do it outdoors, you kind of have to dedicate an oven to just baking those plates. And it's really not worth the effort, I have to say. And there are people who will disagree with me about some of the nuances of historic accuracy. And, you know, as much as I love history and I love uh, being true to it, um, I love bringing history forward and I love bringing process forward into the modern age. And if there's something that can help me enable that better, uh, this is the material to do it. This is actually trophy engraving stock, which is a material made for engraving plaques and awards. So you have silver lettering on a black background. Um, and so it also has this very nice convenient plastic coating that's very satisfying to peel off, but I'm gonna hold off on that until I'm ready to coat the plate. And in this bottle here, and in this stock bottle here, is our eponymous collodion. This is made out of a mixture of a form of nitrous cellulose that's plant fiber uh, that is called gun cotton, which is cotton dissolved in nitric acid, which turns it into a syrupy goo, which is then thinned with um, different solvents uh, to make it more liquid. Uh, in the case of collodion, it is made out of um, rather say it's thin with ethanol uh, or grain alcohol, like you can get at the liquor store, Everclear. We're very popular at the local liquor store here. <laughs> I once uh, I once went in to buy some Everclear for work, mind you, and I popped two bottles of it on the counter and the clerk said, two, huh? And I said, you know, if I told you this was for work, you probably wouldn't believe me, would you? <laughs> but uh, in any case, a uh, very pure grade of uh, grain alcohol here, 190 proof, 95% alcohol. Um, so it contains that, uh, diethyl ether. Yes. The stuff they used to put you to sleep with and, uh, it'll put you to sleep yeah. even now. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I will say that, um, contrary to what you'll read in fear and loathing in Las Vegas, uh, ether, uh, has very little effect on me, at least at this point, but maybe after, you know, 12 years of breathing it on a routine basis, I'm just, my nostrils are sort of dead into its effects at this point. Uh, but it still has a very lovely fragrance to it. It's not unpleasant to smell, at least for me. <laughs> at least it doesn't particularly care for the smell of it, but yeah, different strokes for different folks. Uh, so to this mixture is added metal salts. Uh, in the case of this uh, collodion formula, uh, cadmium bromide, ammonium bromide, and potassium iodide. And it is this iodide and bromide salts that when combined with silver nitrate, which is in this light proof tank here, that is what makes the plate sensitive to light. The plate on its own, not sensitive to light. The collodion on its own, not sensitive to light. Silver nitrate is sensitive to light, but incapable of reading different tonal values until it amalgamates with the iodide and bromide uh, salts that are in the collodion. 
you'll notice that at one point this tank was a sort of blonde wood color and is now largely anything but. So silver nitrate uh, will stain and turn black uh, upon exposure to ultraviolet light or actinic light, the light that uh, any photographic media is sensitive to, it will turn black. So it will blacken anything it touches, that includes your skin, your clothing, your eyeballs in particular, and hence why when we're handling the silver nitrate, always wear protective glasses. Um, that is of utmost importance. Uh, you know, I, I teach workshops in this process here at Penumbra, and I always make sure to emphasize over and over again, safety first. Um, you only get one set of eyeballs, and uh, you want to keep them uh, you want to keep them in good standing with the, the rest of your body. Because uh, although there are blind photographers out in the world, and I actually work for one of them, uh, I don't want to join their ranks necessarily. Nothing personal. I just I'm, I'm enjoying being a full sighted photographer at this this stage in my life. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put my goggles on, and I'm going to peel the plastic off. It's very very satisfying. It's all scratched up and then it's just this clean surface underneath. Don't you just love that? And we hold the plate sort of like a waiter tray here. Um, I don't want to touch the edges until I'm ready to uh, drain the collodion, the excess collodion off. So I'm going to go ahead and coat the plate here. And surface tension keeps the collodion from spilling off the edge along with the steady hand. And capillary action and gravity does the rest of the work for you. And look at that. Didn't spill a drop. After a few thousand plates, this gets a lot easier. So then we just blot our excess over here in the corner. Recork our bottle so it's not to wet out spirits. <laughs> ether. Spirits is the ether, as it were. And I'm just going to go ahead and close the door behind me just so it's not to wet. It's not to let the dark out. It's darker. We've got to keep the dark in, you know. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the light off. And when we coat the pyrocolloidium, we want it to kind of gel up until it's kind of tacky, not bone dry, but not dripping wet either, so as to amalgamate properly with the silver nitrate, which is in this tank here. And this stage, we can do under safe light, darker light. Red safe light. I mean, technically, it should be red. I mean, I've worked under amber safe light, frankly. This material is so insensitive to light, any kind of fogging from safe light doesn't really come into effect. Uh, so I can turn the lights back on set the lid on the tank and I put my goggles back up because it's foggy. And so the plate sensitizes for three minutes, after which point it is ready to be exposed. Uh, it gets loaded into this plate holder here. So this is a modern-ish plate holder. This is made by a company in China called Chamonix that makes beautiful large format cameras and a very nice purpose-built wet plate holder. Um, it loads from one direction only, unlike conventional large format film holders that you load the front and back of with the film. This only loads on one side, has this little springy pressure plate that keeps the plate taut on uh, against the film, the focal plane. I'm trying to say film plane, but the focal plane um, of our camera. And uh, yeah, it's uh, what I uh, tell customers for the portrait studio, the longest three minutes of your life that you're going to wait uh, while the plate sensitizes, but uh, it'll be good by like that. There's no shortage of things to uh, describe and talk about in the, in the picture. So let's go ahead and go out and check on our subject. Uh, and, oh, wow, look at that. Just actually run away. <laughs> there was also a comment in here about the flammability of the process. I mean, uh, excellent point that. there. Um, so the raw materials in particular are, yes, they are flammable. Uh, ether is flammable uh, on its own. And uh, certainly collodion is, it was, you know, collodion in its plain form. So when we talk about collodion, we're usually talking, you know, in this process, we're talking about collodion that has the mixture of iodides, bromides, and additional solvents. When we talk about plain collodion, so collodion was originally conceived of as a medical dressing. And in fact, if you go to a lot of pharmacies in Europe, still carry it, and it's used as uh, again as a as a medical dressing for uh, sealing up cuts. It kind of acts like super glue. Um, 
if you've ever bought liquid band-aid, if you look at the ingredients, collodion USP, it's medical grade collodion is actually one of them. So it's still used today for that purpose, which is one of the beauties of this process that, you know, I mix all of these materials and all these uh, chemicals from scratch. And because of the fact that they have other applications in the real world, um, it's part of why this process is still able to be practiced today. You know, it's one of the things I love about this process is the fact that, you know, you're not beholden to the corporate interest of Kodak or Fujifilm and companies that are not making film for their health at this stage in history. They're, uh, they're doing it because it just barely makes them a profit and there's just barely a demand. And believe me, there's no one more angry about the fact that, you know, Fuji is axing film left and right and Kodak's raising the prices than I am, but I don't get mad, I get even. <laughs> and the best way to do that is to, you know, seize your means of production, you know, learn how to make your own materials. And that's really what drew me to this process and why I, uh, why I recommend that people learn it because one day we may not have film at our disposal, but when you can make your own, you know, there's something better than home growth, right? So anyway, um, okay, so what's, what's the point here? Cause we're coming up on the game. So are we going to yeah, stick with the banana? Yeah, okay, yeah. so the plate is just about ready and we're going to recompose and refocus uh, which is just standard procedure under any circumstances uh, with, with, uh, with this process. You want to recompose. <laughs> was that uh, somebody no. asking a question, making a comment? Oh, okay. Is that my own echo? Yes. No. Oh, it was. wow. Weird. Anyway, <laughs> pardon me. Okay. So into the dark room, back to the dark room we go. So go ahead and close the door. Let's pull on my spectacles here. Shut off the overhead light. And we're going to draw the plate out of the silver tank. And this plate, it kind of takes on this milky appearance. Which I'll show as soon as what I'm doing is blotting the excess silver. I let it drip a little back to the tank. Silver nitrate is made out of silver, obviously, and silver is not an inexpensive commodity. It costs about a dollar a gram, but I think there's about I think there's about 120 grams of silver in this tank, and it needs to be replenished, of course, with usage. So it's about $120 worth of silver in there. So, you know, you want to be gentle around it. No, no sudden movements. So we can see from the front of the plate, it's probably kind of hard to see, but it takes on a kind of milky appearance. It actually has a blue tint to it if I were to turn the lights on, which would be ill-advised at this juncture. And so we were the plate, and I like to align this where it kind of, you see this kind of thick edge here. I like to align that, or I should say, sorry, this thick edge. You can shoot horizontally. I usually shoot vertically when I'm shooting 2D. So I'm going to align this to the top orientation of the plate holder so it lines up on the bottom of my frame. Because as we recall, images form upside down and backwards. Nice snug, perfect fit. I could just trim these this morning. Pressure plate in to keep plate from rattling around. Nice and tight. So we're ready to go. It's on here. And we're ready to go with the picture for everybody in the LA 3D stereo Hi. Now, and an important thing, I'm not just trying to give Alicia a hard time. Uh, for what's important component of wet plate collodion is the plate the must be shot time. while wet. Hence, wet plate collodion. Um, so, um, you know, under temperate indoors conditions, we have about maybe three, four, or five minutes tops if the air conditioner is blasting to shoot the plate. Uh, over time, it will dry out. There is uh, silver iodide, silver bromide that settles on the surface as well as impregnated underneath the surface of the emulsion that we want to take full advantage of all of that that the sweet, sweet silver halides that are formed when uh, the iodides and bromides combine with the silver nitrate. So let's go ahead and get you back into position here. And so the neck brace is still kind of supporting. Yep. Okay. Perfect. That's what we want. And so. But that'll do the trick. So. 
foot. So hold that up and probably about like there ish, but kind of kind of angled the banana a little more towards camera. Yes, it always looks like a banana. That's the spirit. And so that's exactly what we want. And I'm just going to go ahead and adjust my reflector here so I put a little more light on the foreground. That banana is probably going to go kind of darker in tone since, again, orthochromatic processes read yellows and reds darker than they appear in reality. That's also read skin tones darker as well. Um, uh, interesting also about, uh, although none of Alicia's tattoos are visible here, I get a lot of substance for tattoos in the portrait studio. And they oftentimes will disappear because the base black ink of most tattoos actually has this like blue tint. So it must be lighter and reflect the light. Um, um, so hold this a little further away from your face. And yes, we're just getting everything we want in the frame. That is excellent. Go back just a little bit more. And go ahead and pull this reflector back because I'm just sort of seeing it in the frame. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And pull the uh Pull the viewer out a little further from your face. Yep, right there. And we're just going to get Alicia a nice sharp focus here. And I think we're about ready. And why don't you try glancing towards the camera? And open your eyes a little wider. Yep, that's good. And I'm just going to tilt your visor back a little bit. That's really important. All right, I think we're about there. Are you guys, if you want to smile for the shot, or you are. All right. Well, you have to choose. All right. So I tend to get shy with the toothy smiles with wet plate because you're going to notice there isn't really a true bright light in this process, and so I find that when you show teeth, it kind of looks a little funny, like you haven't been. You know, so you know, so in any case, all right. I think we're about just about there. It's gonna make a little micro adjustment here. My composition. All right, that's excellent. If you try glancing up for me, yeah, I kind of like that. Get a little bit more of a okay. poppy catch like from that. And oh, you can actually see a little bit of my frame there. It's a little closer in. Yeah, it's the framing and the camera work that takes the time. Just a quick glance up. And I, now, please, pretty please, mm -hmm. hold perfectly still for me. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lock our focus here. And bring the viewer a little further away from you. Yep, hold perfectly so look up at the light for me. Just like that. Tilt your head up for me just a little bit more and look up at the light and hold perfectly still like that. That's good. And I'm going to go ahead and get my lens cap. So, Carlos, you're going to come around front here. So, as previously mentioned, I'm sorry, this is not my right lens cap. Here is my car. It's part of the process. So, so, we have our lens cap here. And we're going to go ahead and load the holder into the camera. And so this slide in the front here allows us to expose the plate to light, protects it from light going from the darkroom to out in the studio. And we're going to count the subject down. And with our little remote trigger here, it's going to pop the flash. So we catch up with three. And here, close, close, close your screen. And look up at the light. Three, two, one. Boom. And that's that. Doesn't hurt one bit, right? Oh my God, that's the worst. <laughs> I mean, please, by all means, don't sell anybody on that. that on the process. Where are you? Where are uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot of juice, as previously stated, that it takes to make the exposure of this process. 
So we put our protected dark slide back into the plate holder, remove the plate from the camera, and then we're going to go back into the dark room. And we're going to go ahead and get this plate processed. So what am I doing? Of course, we're working under safe. So uh, we develop the plate immediately after exposure. So we're going to prepare our developing area. Carlos, you can come a little closer if you like. So uh, we have here our developer. It's not a conventional black and white darkroom developer. This is mixed from scratch, as are all our chemicals here. It is made out of ferrous sulfate or iron sulfate mixed with acetic acid, that's glacial acetic acid. Some of you who remember black and white darkroom uh, may remember using acetic acid as your stop path. This is pure acetic acid. It slows down the action of the developer. Uh, also contains yet more grain alcohol, uh, which adds this kind of a surfacant. It helps it, the uh, developer flow more evenly over the surface of the plate, um, as well as uh, just distilled water to stay it down. Uh, the plate develops in about 15 seconds. It's developed not in the tray that we dump the plate into, because remember, the plate is wet with chemistry. We don't want to dilute any of that silver halide, any of those light sensitive salts, or otherwise we end up with a very thin, kind of weak image. So the way that we hold the plate is with a, what we call it a helper tray, helps to hold the plate, otherwise we call it the hindrance tray. And it's a very shallow tray that we just, just barely filled with just enough developer to cover the surface. So it's not, again, to thin out any of the light sensitive salts on the plate. So we're going to go ahead and take our plate out. At this juncture, we don't see anything on the surface. No tricks here. And I like to just set a little kind of running time on the timer, but it's sort of by inspection, uh, just as much as by time. I mean, my benchmark is 15 seconds, but if the plate starts to come up faster, I'll stop the development faster. Um, this process doesn't really like pushing developments, unlike with film or whatnot. So uh, if I'm underexposed, it's not a great thing. If I'm overexposed, I can compensate for that a more easily. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to wait till I get to the 30 second mark on the timer here, just to kind of give me an easier time. And ready and set. And here we go. It might be a little bit difficult to see depending on the angle, camera, and whatnot. But up, oh, I see Alicia coming up here. Coming up a little fast, so I'm going to go ahead and drain the developer off. And to stop the development, I just pour water on. All I'm doing is washing the developer off the surface of the plate. Nothing too fancy going on, just washing the developer off. You want to do that nice and quick because the longer the developer sits on the surface of the plate, the lighter it will get. Once the lights are on, that's kind of an interesting nuance of this process is that we can actually look at the plate before it's fixed um, after it's been developed with the lights on. If you were to do that with your black light film or with your uh, black and white prints in the dark room, you'd have one very ruined print. Now, needless to say, if I left the lights on and the plate unfixed forever, it would eventually fade and into nothingness. But we can glance at it momentarily here. So if the lights on, we can see that the plate develops as a negative. So all our tones are reversed here. You also see that the subject is reversed. Um, because again, remember, our images form upside down and backwards. And you know, when we shoot film, it's a translucent material, transparent material. So we flip the negative or the slide upside down and backwards to fix that. Now we can flip the image upside down, but we can't flip it backwards. So it's just the nature of the beast as it were. So anyway, now is really the fun magic moment here. So this is our fixer. This is a somewhat modern fixer. We're using just Ilford Rapid Fix, which is ammonium thiosulfate based. Uh, traditional wet plate fixers would be uh, for making glass negatives. You typically use sodium thiosulfate or hypo, which is again, something some of you may remember from the dark room. Uh, but the traditional uh, fixer for tin types um, was potassium cyanide, which I have, have used in my practice before, uh, in my personal practice. Uh, uh, for teaching purposes, I don't use it. Uh, potassium cyanide, needless to say, has a long and storied history of poisoning folks. 
Um, and especially given the fact that there's a strong acid in the developer, it presents a major hazard if you don't wash the plate thoroughly in between um, development and fixing. So we use ammonium thiosulfate. It's more convenient. Uh, it gives kind of a similar tone that cyanide does. Uh, sodium thiosulfate gives kind of a colder tone. This is a nice sort of happy medium. So anyhow, without further ado, here we are. We're coming nice and close to that camera. Thank you so much, Carlos. Absolutely saving the day. And so as soon as all that blue fogginess clears up, our plate is fixed. And we have our positive. Hooray. Ooh, ah. And you can see those thick edges where the collodion was thick, it takes on more silver. And those will actually disappear with a little more time in the fixer. And as with most things in life, a little gentle agitation helps them along. And there we are. I'm just going to go ahead and pull this out of the developer, sorry, the fixer here. And I'm just going to run a little running water over it. And then we're going to go ahead and look at the plate out under the better room light. It's like a wash that takes her off. Give it a little preliminary wash. One of the other steps here, I'm noticing there's a little bit of a kind of white wispy crud that collects sometimes towards the corners or on the edges. And we call that oyster staining. It sort of looks, I guess, like an oyster shell or something. Like I, I never really understood the terminology there. I think it's kind of odd, but a cotton ball saturated with water takes that off. What that is, is it could be a couple of things. It can be dried silver that was deposited from whatever previous plate was in the holder. It can be unexposed silver in the shadow regions in particular can sometimes, uh, if left in the developer for too long, it can start to want to activate. And because there's no actual image under there, it just kind of turns into this white crud. But it wipes right off. Uh, some people like to leave that in because they think it's sort of makes it look more antique -y. I'm kind of more of a clean plate club kind of guy myself. Um, but easy as that, just wipes off. Just give it a little more rinse, and then let's go look at it out in the light. And you turn the light on. All right. And look, the operation was a success. Oh my God, that's a halfway decent picture. A uh, halfway you. decent picture Thank with you, a baby. more than halfway decent subject. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, great banana too. Heck of a banana, I tell you. <laughs> so again, as previously mentioned, um, everything left is right, everything right is left. Um, ups, down, downs up. Ups, down, downs up. And uh, there you have it. So uh, the last step of the process, uh, so well, the next step for this plate at least, is we're going to wash it um, under running water for about a minute. And then it goes to a tray of purple wash that's uh, for hypoclearing agents. Uh, it's the genericized term for it. This is just a chemical agent that helps to remove the fixer a little more quickly. Um, to my knowledge, um, I was the first person, at least in our organization, to start using purple wash with uh, wet plate collodion. Uh, I figured, you know, especially when teaching workshops, you know, you kind of end up with a big backlog of plates that need to be washed. And I thought, well, verbal wash works for film, works for paper, why not use it for tintypes? Um, truth be told, I've never really done a critical test of with or without thermal wash, but I sleep better at night knowing I've thermal washed my plates. Uh, but we'll return to that um, at a later point here. I'm going to go ahead and take off my wet gloves here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and go out and I'm going to show you guys. So after thorough washing and drying, and of course, in between for posterity's sake, scanning the plate, I like to document the plate digitally, uh, typically before I enact the last step here, which is varnishing the plate. And varnishing the plate serves a couple of different purposes, a few different purposes. 
it protects the surface of the plate against abrasions because it is very fragile. Uh, it's extremely fragile while it's wet, hence my delicate touch with the wet cotton ball in order to remove that oyster staining. Uh, but even when it's dry, it's, um, it's still very fragile. Uh, so the varnish protects against surface abrasions. It also protects against tarnishing because what we have on the surface of the plate after it's been fixed is metallic silver. It is metal, just like jewelry, just like refined silver cutlery. Uh, so it can and will tarnish, uh, especially in a metropolitan area. Um, car exhaust and fumes from smoke and things like that will cause silver to tarnish very quickly. Uh, versus if you're in a rural area or you know, sort of out in the woods someplace, uh, you don't have that problem as quickly. But over time, they can and will tarnish if not varnished. Um, yeah, varnish stars. Varnish stars. Uh, the varnish also um, serves the function of kind of when the plates dry, unlike with uh, silver gelatin prints in the black and white dark room, where uh, prints dry darker, they dry down. Tin types uh, and just wet white coated images in general, they dry up, they dry lighter. So the varnish imparts a little bit of um, opacity back into the image so that it kind of appears the way it did when it was wet. Um, now, one of the key facets of the varnish, and I should have probably thought of this a little sooner, is that it has to be warmed up before we apply it. It flows more evenly that way. So we'll return to this. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and ask uh, how we're doing on time. Uh, if we'd like to maybe go up and look at the library or if we'd like it's, to go well, right to questions and answers. It's about 8.30 now. So I, I think maybe what we should do is open it up to questions. If anybody has questions about the process that, that you just did. I do. I, it's not clear to me how the fixer does a, performs the reversal since obviously fixers don't usually. Yes. So what, the fixer is doing is so our developer is reducing out the unexposed silver. Um, it's eating away at it. The fixer is turning the silver when it's blue like that. It is still silver. It's still a silver halide, right? So remember when I was talking about if you were to turn the lights on and look at that plate uh, when it comes right out of the silver tank it would be a blue color overall. So it's silver halides that are on the surface of that plate. The fixer turns it back into metallic silver. Uh, and that is what turns it into that, you know, into the proper reversed uh, tone. Kind of answers your question. Well, yeah, it does, other than now I don't understand how regular photographic film works that usually gives you a <laughs> Yes, exactly. Now, now, now everything, everything old is new again, right? Um, it's just, I mean, it's just different mechanics of, uh, of the process as far as, um, uh, just as far as, you know, the substrate that you're working with. Um, uh, no, they're just, they, they work in slightly different fashions um, as far as, you know, I mean, you know, it, to, to make an analogy to try and draw the two processes uh, together a little better, you know, when we have black and white film, Right, it is a acetate or polyester uh, support base, yeah. base uh, on top of which we have uh, a binding agent, which is gelatin in the case of film uh, that carries our silver halides. Um, in the case of collodion, our base rather than acetate or polyacetate or polyester or whatnot is a sheet of metal our binding agent is collodion, and it's the same silver halide crystals are, I should say, similar. Um, they are not panchromatic like most of our modern, I say modern, and yet it's already an antique process. We have black and white film, who would have thought? Um, but uh, instead, uh, again, it, it's suspending the same, um, the same uh, light sensitive silver salts, they're just suspended with a different binding agent and they're suspended on a different um, surface. So they actually have a lot more in common than you would, than you would think. Uh, it's simply a matter of, again, the binding agents and uh, incidentally, the spectral sensitivity or lack thereof. I mean, you can buy, of course, orthochromatic uh, black and white film. It behaves a little bit differently than this does, but similar idea. 
So we got a semi answer to the question, I suppose. But uh, but in any case, uh, you know, as I said, you know, this process is a lot more in common with uh, with film, as you know it, than you probably even realize. There's a question a in question. the chat. Oh, uh, go ahead. Ask ask your question. Are, are you talking to me? Okay. Yeah, Valerie, go ahead. Yes, it was a wonderful presentation and uh, just really felt like it was fantastic seeing each of those processes. <clears throat> oh, I'll speak up. Um, can you can you tell us how you got inspired to embrace this photography and this process? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, what's your name? Valerie. Valerie, very nice to meet you, Valerie. I, I probably, I, I mean, I go on uh, your uh, the LA 3D Club meetings with Alicia. We, I've probably seen your face at one point or another. But anyhow, uh, to answer your question, though, um, you know, I first learned this process, as I mentioned earlier, back in 2009. And, you know, there were a lot of factors that influenced me. But I, I think the, the main driving factor was, you know, around 2008, was when, among other things, Polaroid had declared bankruptcy and a lot of major film manufacturers were just discontinuing a lot of the products that I was just coming to love, being relatively new to photography. And, you know, as, you know, as a student in college, you know, I was, I, I had been bitten by the bug and I, I was very much about uh, direct positive processes. Uh, I loved shooting slide film. Uh, one of my earliest experiences with shooting slide film was, in fact, with a um, with a uh, TDC uh, Stereo Vivid, um, and I just I loved anything that was again direct positive. I liked that. I liked Polaroid, and you know, all of a sudden, I was seeing that a lot of the materials that I knew and loved were no longer available, and. I, when I learned that there were people, and I learned about this process in history books and in textbooks and things like that, but when I found that there were actually people practicing it, I thought, huh, I, let's see if it can be done. And lo and behold, I found out it could be done. Uh, so, yeah, that was, I mean, it, in many ways, it was kind of born on a whim. And then, and then from there, I decided, uh, at one point or another, well, I guess I'll just do this the rest of my life. <laughs> and since then, I've, you know, in addition to doing portraits in the Tintype studio here at Penumbra, I've also done a lot of commercial work with this process, um, including for advertising, for entertainment, uh, a lot of musicians, actors, uh, promotional images for TV shows. I even did some stuff for a video game uh, with this process as well. Uh, I could rattle off a few different things but uh yeah that's uh that was the inspiration it's what's kept me going great there's a question in the chat um uh, i guess back in the day with a horse-drawn wagon dark room filled with one load of chemicals uh, about how many pictures would a photographer be able to take um you would be able to take as many as you could uh as many as you could bring equipments and uh, chemicals for, I should say. Um, you know, I will say a lot of photographers in the 19th century had uh, darkroom assistants that would kind of aid and abet in the coding and the sensitizing process. I mean, take the risk. Yes, and I mean, you know, I, I used to, I mean, I'm used to working solo a lot of the time, but you know, when I am working with a team, uh, particularly if we're kind of exchanging roles and say, you know, getting the composition together and handling the washing and the varnishing and whatnot. I think, you know, you know, we did uh, at Penumbra, we did a, uh, we did a in-store event for uh, Filson, an outdoors, you know, clothing brand uh, at one of their stores here in the city. And, you know, with, you know, a team of people, uh, but me doing the work in the dark room, I think I was doing with, you know, sort of an exchange of plate holders, a plate every five minutes. So that was doing, you know, so sensitizing two plates, taking them out of the out of the out of the silver, handing them off to somebody to go shoot, bringing them back, uh, developing them, you know, one at a time. That is, and then throwing them in the fix. So every five minutes, and now three of those minutes are being occupied by, by, the, by plate the plate sitting, sitting in the sitting silver. silver. So, so pretty much the physical limit of how quickly you can work. 
So I would imagine in the 19th century, people were not in quite as much of a rush, but that's about how many you could do if you were at your absolute physical limit. Uh, so multiply that by how many you know hours in the day, and that's how many you could do in a day, I guess. Let's see. Any, anyone else have a, a question? Yeah, how does he get I see, I see. I, can I Can I say something? Right, Andrew, sorry. How does he get it into parallel view from the uh, the the tin type from the iron plate? How do you get it? How do you excellent. get it? That's an excellent question, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up because it was on the tip of my tongue. A um, couple of ways to do that. Uh, the easier way is to scan the plate and then output it digitally, and uh, and then go ahead and print it, you know, on the inkjet printer. Otherwise, we chop it in half. And we have a plate cutter that is for doing such things. And, you know, I should mention the fact, I probably should have mentioned this a lot sooner, that, you know, in the 19th century, 99.9% .9 of stereo images were shot uh, as glass negatives and then printed in the darkroom. Tintype uh, being, you know, one of a kind image uh, was generally not a medium for stereo. Uh, but it's something that we do now. Uh, because it's, if for no other reason, then it's a cool thing. Uh, it's a tangible product. It's a tangible object. It's something you can hold in your hand. Um, and again, as you saw, barring uh, the time it takes to compose and light and get your subject to stand still, um, it's a fast process. So yes, as uh, as unexciting as it sounds, yeah, that's how that's how we get it parallel. We just chop it in half and flip them. If you wanted to view uh, the original, you're saying if it was a, a glass plate, then then you could print it somehow. You could. You. I mean, I've seen special contact printing frames in which there's a sliding mask where you would print one half, remove it, and then print the other half. Although. I've also seen glass plates that were cut in half with a glass cutter and then exchanged from one side to the other. Um, and, you know, I'm so I'm seeing in the chat, uh, somebody's asking about seeing the library. And so I'm going to go ahead, if it's well, all right with everyone, I, we can continue to do some we, questions and answers. We've got uh, uh, at least two more questions. I see Alicia's got her hand raised. Oh, well, actually, yes. Actually, Hi, what's up? I, I just wanted to like say, because yeah, I don't know if Sam mentioned it or not, but uh, he does uh, stereo tin types from digital files. So if anybody wants a stereo tin type made of their digital file, uh, he could do that. That is correct. Um, that is a service that is, uh, you, you can see on our website on Penumbra Foundation, uh, if you go to the Tintype Studio section, you'll see digital to Tintype service. Uh, there isn't a specific stereo option there because, quite frankly, um, well, I'm bringing stereo into this house. Yes, because quite frankly, you know, no one. You know, I don't have to tell this crowd that you know, stereo is uh, uh, could use some public relations love. So um, yeah, uh, you're all the first to know. We can make stereo tin types and might i also add i can correct for parallel without having to chop them in half uh from your digital files so uh like i said if you go on our website you can select we have sizes ranging from four by five to five by seven uh it tends to be kind of be the more popular size and if you wanted say if there was interest in you know say standard what is it uh what is it, what is it seven and a half by, seven by, by three and a half seven by three and a half uh, stereo card format we could do that as well uh you'd have to just write me a little note indicating you want that but uh, i'd be more than happy to do that as well uh i think steven suzanne had a question i actually used to do this process myself a long time ago and the problem i ran into is i tried to hand tint them and it never really seemed to work do you ever do that uh, uh, I have not, not hand-tinted a plate, a plate for a long, long time, time now. We're talking about different tinting. So, uh, just out of curiosity, what were you using to tint? 
I had a little kit of a little ink bottles that held about half an inch each that I bought that were an antique. Oh, oh. Uh, okay, so okay, like the so spot like... tone. I had little uh, brushes okay, okay. and all that sort of thing. Yes. yes. So, so I it's interesting. I, I spoke to a conservator at the New York Public Library about different hand coloring methods. And the way I learned um, was actually using dry pigment. So rather than using a liquid pigment, you would work with just like a powdered, um, I mean, I've used like powdered pigments that you would use for oil painting. Uh, you can also use what's called pan pastels, which are powdered uh, pastel chalk. Uh, and basically what you do with that is you kind of work the pigment into the emulsion. You're effectively scratching it into the emulsion. And it's kind of a delicate balancing act because if you're too delicate of a touch, you'll just be doing it all day and you'll get nowhere. If you're too aggressive, you will scratch the emulsion. Now I have read, or sorry, I should say, I was told by a conservator that they had identified that some tin types and amber types were hand tinted with liquid pigments, but it was not as common. Powdered pigments were much more common. It's also worth mentioning the fact that, you know, unlike a gelatin emulsion, um, the collodion emulsion, when it dries, becomes very hard. Um, it uh, shrinks a lot as well. It's not nearly as porous as gelatin. Even dry gelatin has a little porosity to it, uh, like a silver gelatin print. Um, a tin type, not so much. So, I uh, hope that answers your question. Uh, if we have any other questions, I'd love to take those. Can you reclaim some of the silver? Excellent question. Um, I don't personally, it tends to be, I mean, you can reclaim the silver from your fixer just as you would your waste fixer in general. Um, one of the beauties of the fixer when you're using it for wet plate is that uh, you can see when it's exhausted. Basically when it stops working, visually you could when it's still and it doesn't clear the image for negative to positive you know it's exhausted and yes that i reclaim as for the silver that's in that you know kind of in the paper towel it's kind of diminishing returns uh it is worth noting though that in the 19th century you know photographers were so stingy with their silver and you know just before we have paper towels you know, they would use a piece of felt or cloth and they would at the end of the day wring the silver out recrystallize it, distill it back into metallic silver, re-acidify it with, with nitric acid. And uh, yeah, so it was, it, that was kind of common practice. Because you have to remember that in the 19th century, there really was no such thing by and large as an amateur photographer. Photography was almost exclusively a professional practice. So every dollar you put in, you wanted to get back out. So hence the reclaiming the silver in that fashion. Thanks. Do you know why they called them tin types? Uh, how that name got stuck to it? You know, there's a few different uh, theories behind that. Uh, and I don't buy a lot of them. <laughs> One of the theories is that uh, a tin was a nickname for a dime, 10 cents, tin, whatever. And that, you know, a, a, a smaller format portrait, you know, like someone that's sort of like the size of say, almost like a postage stamp, um, the gem tin you would call that cost 10 cents. I don't buy that for a second. The other theory, which is, you know, logical, but I'm a little skeptical of it as well, is that you would use tin snips to cut the plates down to size. Um, again, plausible, but it seems a little dumb to me. Uh, oh, it I, rhymes, you know. Yeah. It sounds exactly. good. Yeah, yeah I, I've always been of the school of thought that alliteration is a great marketing tool and that, you know, Tin is just a cutesy sounding word. You know, like the, the nickname for the Model T Ford was the Tin Lizzie, but there was no, there's no tin in a Model My dad used to have a Model T Ford. There's no tin in them. They're made out of brass and steel. But brass and steel Lizzie is, does not, doesn't sound, I mean, it sounds like a nickname for, you know, 
Some of you meet on Grand Concourse over here in the Bronx, but you know. Uh, anyway, uh, uh oh, all so, so it was it was easier to sell a tin type than a ferro type. Exactly, exactly, and and worse yet, Milano type was the original patent name. I don't even know where. I mean, I, where that comes from is beyond my realm of material understanding. So uh, these, the tin types, like I, I have three tin types of. They were probably taken around 1910. My mother and her brother and sister, they, they look like they're about, my mother looks like she, she's about 10 years old. But these are the kind of things that I think were taken at like at Coney Island, that sort of thing. And it, how, how do they develop it? Do they actually, uh, is it, if it is a tin type using a process the way you've just done it, uh, how do they, you know, or did, could they take the picture and then go, take it somewhere else to be developed and you know and they um, mail it back to them i think right um no in all likelihood it was processed right on site um there were some methods of preserving the plate uh towards the latter half of the 19th century it was methods of kind of drying it out partially and then putting a preservative agent usually some kind of organic material uh a coating of honey actually was used to do that so it, it, it would it wouldn't make the plate quite dry but it was so it was called dry collodion but really in all likelihood uh the images you're talking about they were just processed on site um again it, and and astute observation and just observation but astute facts is that the, one of the few niche applications of this process is exactly at places like Coney Island or, you know, on the boardwalks, you know, and like, you know, the Jersey shore or something like mm -hmm. that. Because, you know, it was still a fast way to get, you know, pre Polaroid. It was still one of the fastest ways to get a final image without a negative in between. Thank you. You're most welcome. I, you know, I have a few. Camera here. That's, that's, a direct... uh, it was, it's a, that's well, it's interesting because they would call that, you know, I should say, and there is a slight chance I'd have to see the image, but, you know, there is a direct positive camera that Alicia pointed out that made what were called, now they would call them ferrotypes, but they really chemically have nothing to do with tin types as we know them. So this is made by company called Mandel's PDQ said so this was a direct positive uh, camera in which you know the image process in the camera with wet chemistry again this is pre Polaroid so it's not all integrated you know, into a single packet but you would have these little metal plates that uh, were sensitized with uh, silver gelatin at that point not with collodion and so this was kind of an all-in-one system that uh, kind of started to do surf collodion towards the early part of the 20th century. By post-World War I, this was really more of the popular methodology as opposed to uh, as opposed to wet plate collodion. This is kind of what you would call a street camera. Uh, or I think, I think I saw in the chat somebody alluded to Afghan box cameras and... Uh, You know, I, I, I struggle a little with the Afghan box camera thing, because although it's something that is practice, it's a form of photography and it's a tool that's used in Afghanistan. It doesn't originate from Afghanistan. Street cameras have a very long history uh, that goes outside of that part of the world. Uh, they were used all over the world. Um, but again, they go much further back than that practice. And somebody asked for a three- 60 of the library so i'm going to go ahead and uh indulge everyone in that so this is our research library which uh everyone's perusing books in and we have all kinds of manuals that uh range from historic uh photographic manuals on chemical process we have some 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 greatest hits here silver sunbeam the camera and the pencil of heliographic art um chemistry, Brewster's Optics, which is Alicia's favorite book in the Not library here. Oh, it's one of your favorites. You always go for that one. I do first. go for it a lot. But uh, a lot of excellent treaties on optics in this section. We have, you know, again, chemical process over here, a lot of periodicals from the 19th century. Philadelphia Photographer is a really excellent source of information. Um, we have those hard bounds and uh, a lot of nifty artifacts we have some other 
what look like torture devices, but these are, well, they are a little torturous. These are posing devices. Uh, a lot of these ones such as this, or this one were for uh, photographing children, uh, or you have a chair here that has the head brace built in. Uh, we have over here a, this is a genuine 19th century head brace. I can't begin to say how rare these are. I've seen maybe two for sale in the past 10 years. I attempted to buy one and uh, it was well outside my price range. Um, and then over here we have, uh, you know, well, you know, 3D clubs. So we got to talk, show some stereo goodies. I have a nice little, this little viewer down here, a little viewer over here with a little ooh la la over there. Ask them to name the viewers. Uh, yes. Uh, why, 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 let's have a little, a little pop quiz here. What, what, what are the names of these viewers here? Because I'm a big dumb dumb. I don't know about stereo. Me just do tin type. <laughs> well, well the, the box shaped one you have looks like a 45 by 107, or no, maybe a 6 by 13. Looks like a oh. Jules, is it Jules Richard? <laughs> uh let's see here uh yep yeah. that is correct it's a, it's a richard veriscope viewer that you were right on the money look at that well it's upside yeah. down it's upside down and it probably six by 13 centimeter the other popular size was 45 by 107 millimeters and that that's that's like 127 format but in uh in like a dry plate right yeah well the yeah the uh 45 by 107 would have been 127 roll film that would do that size and six by 13 would be two and a quarter, two and a quarter. Makes sense. Actually, Carlos brought with him a, a lovely little um, of the smaller format viewers, uh, which is uh, which is very nice thing to bring in, it's real beauty. Um, but anywho, uh, like, you know, I don't want to totally dominate the meeting here. I know we have other things to discuss, well, but- Sam, thank um, you so much for for uh, spending the evening showing us how the the tintype process works. Yeah. Uh, this was really fantastic. And uh, one one last question: um, If somebody wanted to visit the Penumbra Foundation in New York, where would they find it, and how would they be able to schedule a visit there? Oh, uh, well, if you happen to be just visiting and you just want to come say hi. Uh, the best thing you can do is just shoot me an email. Um, uh, my email is um, uh, that you should contact me with for Penumbra Business is easy. It's sam at penumbrafoundation.org. Uh, you know, we're pretty informal here. If you want to just drop in, I'm not here every day, but I will make the time for you if you happen to vi be visiting. If you want to schedule a tintype uh, portrait appointment, go on our website and you can book one online. Um, and the other thing I would say is if you're interested in learning how to do this process or other darkroom photographic processes, um, sign up for a workshop. Uh, we are offering in-person workshops with smaller sizes to enable social distancing and whatnot, but we are very much open for business. Uh, we also have online classes, um, more kind of theory-based than necessarily hands-on practical, uh, classes, but, um, but in any case, uh, yeah, like I said, if you're interested in having, oh, and I should also say, if you're interested in having one of your stereo images made into a tintype, you can book that or you can purchase that service online as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, there you have it. And like I said, uh, check out more information on our website, penumberfoundation.org. If you're on Instagram, you can find us on there. You can find the tintype studio on there as well. We have a separate account for that. And, um, and uh, if, if you want to follow me on Instagram, although I'm not very active on there, uh, my Instagram handle is actual Sam Dole with underscores in between because somebody else had Sam Dole without that stuff in it. <laughs> Kill him. Wonderful. Well, right. thank you so much. Let's give, let's give Sam a big round of applause. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> really thank you for having cool. me. And uh, thank you. Thank you also. Thank you, Carlos, for for your camera work. Yes, Carlos absolutely uh, saved the day. Yay. And here's, oh, here's here's his viewer he recently got, by the way, this absolutely gorgeous viewer here, 127 okay. format. Can anybody ID it? It doesn't have a maker's name on it. Um, that one looks like it's made by a company called, I think it's uh, Matty, M-A-T-T-E-Y, it's French. 
Told you. That would make sense. Thanks. Alicia Thanks. called it. Yep. Excellent. All right. You, 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 I, I will give everyone back to, uh, to the greater okay. world of 3D at large, to the 20th and 21st centuries. Thank you. Respectively. Thank, thank you so much. And, and, and thank you, uh, Alicia. I, I should also point out, um, I first saw this demonstration on National 3D Day last month. Uh, Alicia Hi. Uh, did broadcasting from Penumbra. And mm -hmm. um, late in the evening, Sam did this mm -hmm. demonstration. And I was just enthralled by it and, and thought this would be great to have at the group. So thank you, Alicia, for introducing me to Sam. You're welcome. That's it. <laughs> okay, so we're not gonna, we're probably gonna not have as much time to finish the meeting. We have a couple things uh, planned. So David Starkman and Susan Pinsky are club archivist, and they always have a nice little tidbit. We'll do that, and then we'll do a little bit of show and tell. So okay. let's spotlight David. And are you going to be sharing your screen? So yeah, I'll I'll share my screen. Uh, well, uh, what I'll be sharing today, I'll mention just from the club archive. Uh, well, I guess for people that are new, maybe I should. Well, anyway, let's see if I share this page. Uh, this is uh, 3dlegends.com, and I wanted to share this page because of since we're dealing with antique processes today, uh, one of the people on the uh, 3D Legends is uh, a, a fellow named Jack Naylor. Uh, and again, everybody who's on 3D Legends are people who are no longer with us. And Jack Naylor was a, a, a wealthy and major collector of uh, photographica of every sort uh, from daguerreotypes to, well, you name it. Oh, spy cameras. He, he had a picture on the Smithsonian of, uh, cover of the Smithsonian Magazine. They had an article about his spy cameras. And apparently because of that cover, which was a little bit sexy, it was the most popular Smithsonian cover ever. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a picture of Jack himself with a bunch of spy cameras. Uh, this is a camera that looks like a pair of binoculars. There is a camera in the head of this cane. There is a camera on the button of this cravat. Uh, and what looks like uh, maybe a book or something in his hand is also a camera. <laughs> so uh, that's an article. This is, oops. This is an article about his collection. Uh, we, we visited a number of times and took some stare. Here's like a, a tiny, tiny, tiny tin type. You know, they made ones that were postage stamp size. He collected every kind of camera. This was a camera used in World War I that was attached to a pigeon. And I guess after a certain timed amount of time, it would fly and take a photo and then it was a homing pigeon, it would come back and they would develop the picture. Aerial spy. Um, and these are more pictures from that article about miniature and spy cameras. And then in the stereo uh, area, like this, uh, one camera in the middle, this was a camera, it's called the Segrist, which I think had the fastest shutter at the time. I think it was a couple thousandth of a second. And there was a stereo version of the Segrist. So it was pretty rare. Here's just other, all kinds of, he, this was in his basement. Uh, his house, when he had his house, this house built, uh, he had this basement custom built to show his collection. So it was uh, climate controlled, the air was filtered, nothing ever needed to be dusted because the air was totally filtered. So uh, 
you can uh, peruse this site at your leisure. This is uh, me and David Berter visiting Jack. And uh, Berter's holding, this is like, I, I forget how many lenses this had. This was a camera called the Lentic, which took, I think about, I don't know, two, four, six, seven, I think about 12 or 14 pictures at once for lenticulars. <laughs> so uh, this is just a great antique camera collection. And he also had a huge collection of daguerreotypes. And uh, one of his, oh, here's the uh, NSA visited him. This was at uh, one of the, we had an outing where a whole group of people from NSA visited. This was a group photo taken there. I managed to get in the middle. <laughs> And here's some of his daguerreotypes of all sizes. And so uh, that's uh, Jack Naylor, Jack Naylor's collection. Oh, and this whole collection was, uh, he had two actually. The, the original collection was sold to a museum in Japan. And I can't remember who, I think uh, an individual collector, but then, then when the, this whole basement was emptied out and thought that was going to be the end of it, but then he bought a number of other major collections and filled it up again. And then uh, just before he passed away, he sold off the second collection at auction. Here's some more stereo items. Talking about some of those great antique viewers. Alicia commented in the chat that Sam actually bought one of his cameras at the auction. Ah, great. Yeah, well, they, they were, he had quite, like I said, quite a huge collection. Here's some panoramic photos of the basement. And uh, one of his prize items was this. Uh, for those who know about Leicas, uh, there were ones that were called Luxus Leicas, which were gold-plated instead of uh, nickel or whatever, and uh, usually covered in something other than leather, like a snakeskin or whatever. I think this was a red snakeskin, uh, gold Luxus Leica, but what made it extra rare was Leica made a stereo uh, attachment that used uh, prisms. I forget if it was called, it's either the Serioli or the, I, anyway, uh, this had the matching gold stereo uh, attachment to it. And uh, I won't get into the long story about how he acquired it, but uh, one interesting story was that one day a, a, Jap a, a fellow had flown from Japan, showed up at his doorstep unannounced, with $100,000 in cash uh, to offer him for this camera, and he turned it down. <laughs> uh, Jack didn't need the money. <laughs> so there's a whole story here about the Leica camera that you can read. And uh, he was friends with, if uh, those of you know, the, the famous photographer, Margaret Burke White. Uh, he personally was friends with her. And in her will, she donated, uh, she willed all of her equipment and everything to Jack. So he had her whole collection, her cameras, the ones she shot famous life, motor, life, photo, life magazine photographs for, the uh, ones she used in World War II. Uh, he had all of Margaret Burke-White's Burke -White's equipment. And there's Jack show, proudly showing off his uh, gold Leica. <laughs> I won't show you more, but you can peruse it at your at your leisure. Uh, then I'll mention also uh, on the uh, if you go to the club website, uh, which maybe I can do here. Uh, on the club website, if you scroll down. 
to here where it says 3D Club Archive. I'll just remind you that's how to find the club archive. And uh, there are a menu across the top and don't overlook the button that says more. And uh, the latest section to be updated, Susan has added a lot more to the section of 3D pictures by club members. Uh, we recently got a donation from uh, Rick Finney and Jerry Walter, who were past presidents of the club. Uh, Jerry was the president when we joined the club in 1977. Uh, they were great 3D photographers. They're both still alive uh, in their, I think they're both around 90 now and uh, living uh, in New Mexico. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of new pictures uh, of theirs that were award-winning uh, pictures in this section of 3D pics by club members. Uh, there's Oliver Dean from uh, quite a few years back at one of our 3D division movie, me movie division meetings uh, with, uh, you might not even recognize John Hart next to him. And that was uh, a dual regular eight uh, projector, projection setup that John Hart had for projecting a twin Super 8 3D. Anyway, that's on the club website, uh, archives, yeah, pictures by club members. And of, and of club members. So I'll just leave it at that and stop sharing. If I can figure out where that is. Oh, here we are. And that's, uh, that's my little presentation from the are uh, from the archives that was great David thank you sure uh, okay next up I think we have time for a little bit of show and tell and we have a regular show and tell host Valerie Latura and Val what do you got for hey. us today? hi hi everybody uh, great presentation great night thank you David Starkman and uh, just wonderful we have three people that I'd like to point out. Um, I'd like to start with Bruce Gordon, Gorin, who was a 3D member way back and was the first to show 3D images, but had moved to San Francisco. But he used to attend our meetings regularly. And he's here tonight, um, coming back after 20 years. So I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, Bruce, can you say a quick hi? Let me see if I can find them in the uh, participants <laughs> chat. Bruce Gorin, you awake, yeah, he's, Bruce? He's, he's he's muted and his camera's off right now, so. Ah. Uh, well, we asked him, so uh, maybe okay. he'll come well, up a little later. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm maybe, glad maybe, that you were able to join us. And I uh, we'll have two people that responded for the show and tell. Um, David Starkman and also um, Eric. So since uh, David just presented, Eric, would you like to go first? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the only two. I'm going to grab one of my cameras too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm going to turn off my anaglyph so you can actually see what I'm going to show you. Okay. So I have, I have a, a couple cameras here. Uh, first one is let me open it up here. So this is a uh, a Kodak Stereo Hawkeye camera. Um, dates to about 1910, um, and this one's been. Uh, fully restored it's it's in really nice condition i haven't used it yet as a camera but um uh, I, i'm actually thinking of maybe uh, uh trying to take some pictures with it at some point it looks really sweet condition is it like 116 size film here i'll pull the, the lenses out here and you can see the the, the bellows are, are in really great shape and even the leather bellows isn't dried out. Yeah, yeah it looks yeah. good. It, it, it was, it, it's a very nice 
restoration. So that's the first one that I have today. Let's get some film for that. The other camera that I have, this is this is one that I find very interesting. This is a German camera uh, from about 1914. It's called the Cosmo Clack. And um, one of the things that's really interesting about this, let me show you the back. So I'll move the plate holder out of the way. So you can see the, the septum in the middle there. This camera could be used as either a stereo camera or a panoramic camera. There's a release here, and then the whole lens mechanism can, can slide so that you move the left lens to the center position. And as you slide the lens over, it moves the septum out of the way. Shift this over. Cool. So then you can take a, a panoramic view with the same camera. But wait, That's there's good. more. Wait, there's more. Wow. Um, the, uh, the lens block, in addition to moving side by side for stereo or panoramic, the, whole, the entire lens block can be removed. The, uh, the carrier can be removed and replaced with a slide holder. And I have a second one here. It's the same camera body, but now it's the viewer. So you put viewing lenses on the front and a slide carrier on the back. And you use the same uh, focus control to adjust the focus on it. But you can use it as the viewer for uh, the slides that you've shot with it. Whoa. So I, I like in a little these. travel box. Um, I don't know what they came in originally. I've just uh, I I had the camera version of it, and I'd always heard that there was a viewer that could be swapped out for the lens, and finally found another Cosmo Clack, but in the viewer configuration. Um, cool. And uh, I do have there is a. I don't, I don't know if if you'll be able to see this if I hold it up here. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there, there, there is there is actually an image in there. Like yeah, we can see it, and and it does work. So it's it's a it's a pretty cool. And it looks like is that a forty five by one hundred seven size? It looks like. Um, I'm not sure. I, I guess uh, I. Well, if you measure it, it's something. if it's yeah, about, yeah, I can I can measure it. If it's if it's a two and a quarter by five inches or whatever then it's four then it's six by 13. uh it looks it looks maybe a little smaller than that yeah um, well it's one or the other probably you can measure the slide it's a, yeah i'll have i'll have to i'll have to open it up and, and take out the yeah. slide to measure it but it's a sheet film so you got to load them one at a time yeah yeah so that's the Cosmo Clack. Did you steal that from 3D Space? The, they're from the 3D Space <laughs> collection. Yeah. <laughs> okay, David Starkman. Oh, I'll just have to tell Eric that that's I, I, that's my favorite name of any of the old stereo cameras, the Cosmo Clack. I mean, yeah, yeah, I, I love that too. Yeah. It's a oh, we did get a message from Bruce Gorin. Yes. Not set up for video this meeting. Back in the day, I was using Topaz 3D computer software and an analog film recorder. Ah. After processing, I mounted with supplies I got from David and Susan's company, Real 3D. <laughs> Some of my slides were featured at early SIGGRAPH conventions. I worked at KLCS TV as an engineer from 1984 through 1995. Well, I'd like to hear more from you, Bruce. Let's hear from Bruce. I wonder if Bruce, this wasn't my show and tell, but I wonder if Bruce did some of the images. This is uh, some of the first computer graphics I ever saw in 3D. This was given away, I think, at a SIGGRAPH. And uh, 
it's a Viewmaster from, I guess, a company called with a ISCO computer graphic software. <laughs> and uh, these, this had computer graphics in it, and it was at, at a SIGGRAPH convention. But that wasn't my show and tell. Uh, because, Sorry, David. But... <laughs> yeah, because tintypes were the subject. Uh, I thought I'd show off maybe some of you who went, I forget which NSA convention it was, one of the ones that was in Orange County, but I forget which one, there was a woman who was uh, offering to do stereo tintypes while you wait. <laughs> and uh, this was uh, one that we had done of me and Susan. And, uh, you know, right then and there, you know, she uh, would process it cut them apart. She had mounts already made up. So the mount was ready to go. And her company name, it's uh, CAS Tintype Photography. And she's got a website. If you look it up, I think her name was like Catherine Segura. I think she's down in the San Diego era, er, area. And I think she still does it, but she would do the, uh, well, I don't know if she always does stereo, but for NSA, she especially set up to do Stereo tintypes. So uh, we were glad to have that. Yeah, that was in Irvine. In Irvine? Yeah. And then, and she was set up to do, she never got more business than she got there. She was totally oh, she, exhausted. She was busy something. constantly for what, all three days or yeah. something of, yeah, you had to make an appointment and uh, she was just one after the other busy doing it. Uh, and then this, which won't be very hard to show. Uh, I did a scan of it that was uh, on the cover of this week, this month's uh, 3D news. So you can see it there, uh, but this is a, t a, a daguerreotype. So it's like a mirror. And even with a viewer, you really need to have, I found the best way is uh, to put a, a stereo lens uh, viewer surrounded by black velvet and look through it that way so that because any reflection just shows up like the mirror but this was a uh, a modern daguerreotype in 1992 we went to uh there is a daguerreotype society sort of like uh stereoscopic like nsa uh and just once we thought well it'd be interesting to see what they do and in 1992 we went to one of their conventions it was in the boston area and this man named robert schler uh uh, do, uh, did, and I don't know if he's still around, did modern daguerreotypes using the old process with mercury, you know, the really dangerous way uh, to do it. And uh, uh, we had made arrangements in advance, even though he didn't normally do stereo. Uh, he uh, had set up a stereo lens board for his daguerreotype camera. And uh, we had this taken at, uh, in Paul Wing's backyard. And then uh, he processed and So uh, he did like uh, about four, each one is an original, there's no copies. So uh, we got like four different uh, exposures and each one of us got one and uh, each one's unique. And we had to pose for about 25 seconds was the exposure time. So we're posed very, uh, you know, stiff. And uh, his uh, developing equipment, he had uh, like a, an electric fan with a hose that was like, like a, uh, the hose from a, a, uh, a clothes dryer, you know, like a three inch or four inch diameter hose that went 30 or 40 feet away from where he was doing the developing to exhaust the mercury vapors <laughs> to a safe distance. And that was how we had these made. So I'm just very pleased to have a modern daguerreotype stereo. And I say modern, well, 1992. <laughs> so that's my show and tell. Thank you, David. Um,
that was really interesting, especially I'm familiar with the image, uh, seeing it on the cover and using it for that. So um, that uh, Teresa Gonzalez so beautifully put together our oh, yeah. newsletter. I'll say so one just, thing I found out about these, by the way, you know, as I say, how as, as hard as they are to view, uh, I found not just with this one, but with we, we Susan does collect uh, or has a small collection of daguerreotypes, only a couple are stereo. But what we discovered is uh, on our Epson V700 flatbed scanner, you just lay it on the scanner, they scan beautifully, and all the mirror stuff doesn't seem to happen. <laughs> so that scan that's on the uh, cover of the latest issue was done by scanning it on a flatbed scanner. So it's a good thing to know. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, thank you, David. Uh, Steve Barrison, did you say you want to get something you want to share? Yeah, since we're doing daguerreotypes, I thought I'd do something a little different just to end the meeting. But uh, This is a camera I just got in the mail a few weeks ago or less than a week ago. Let me uh, turn off my background first. Oh, okay. yeah, didn't they just go on sale at a deep discount? Yeah, exactly. Uh, You'll have to tell us about that. I can't find the uh, where to turn off the, uh, it's the invisible cam background. It's it's next to the button, the arrow up next to where it says stop video. You uh, ah, you want to change is. the virtual background? Thank you. None. There there we you go. go. Yeah, this is the humanized camera. And what it is, is it's been around for quite a while. It's eight lenses. It's divided in 4Ks. It's a 360 degree camera. So it takes stereo. It comes with software to convert it into a uh, 180 or 360, actually just 360 for your uh, I use it on my Oculus. You can use it on any, maybe a Google Cardboard. But uh, the type of sites that you can use it on are going down, but you can still do it on Oculus. So what it is, eight lenses, it comes with software. It really eats up your memory. But uh, it's, they came out with a higher resolution one that was 8K. This is 4K. The 8K ones, pretty good. This is pretty cheesy as far as the output because it's 4K divided to 360 degrees. But it was originally like an $800 camera. If I had spent 800 on this, I would be, you know, it would go back. But now it's down to 200. So at 200, even then it's a little high, but it's okay. Because I bought another camera which I use a little bit more is this one is a 180 and this was 100. So this only covers half the area. It's a Lenovo Daydream. And this I bought new for 100. Now they're going back for 200. I don't know why their prices started to go up again. So I guess they're hitting that inflection point. So if you do want to buy a camera for your virtual reality, this would probably be good. It's just that you're diluting your pixels a lot. Uh, it took a long time to figure out how to use it because they don't have the best uh, customer service. So kind of had to go back in and uh, refigure out stitching. A lot of things I haven't worked on for a long time, but once I got back into it, it's pretty easy. And you can process the video in uh, Premiere, Adobe Premiere, but they also have their own package, which actually works pretty well. Or you can restitch it with some plugins in Premiere and Adobe After Effects and get a passable workflow. Steve, do you know how much the 8K version costs? It's gone. They don't oh. have any left. Okay. So yeah. You're going to have to buy have, the 8K used. I have one of the 8K ones, and frankly, the files are so big that I can't even work with them. 
Yeah, the, these files are easy to work with, but they're crap. You know, they're they're just uh, yeah, all you can think of is oh, this is so compressed, it's crazy. It could be the Oculus, but I don't think it is. This one, yeah. even this one's, I think the same. I think it's 4K as well, but it's only half the area, so it's still not very good. They're still uh, just okay. I just don't think they're there yet with these type of cameras, but uh, they're really counting more on people using, uh, I think using things like Unity to make environments where they don't really have to deal with this. But I've been using Blender a lot and I'm uh, finding that even with Blender to make anything decent takes all night to process, to render, so. That's another bag of worms. Maybe I'll get two in a workshop. But... Oh, uh, did you have something to say, Alicia? She work hard, render fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think it's uh, everybody knows there's a workshop on Sunday, Saturday. Sorry. Yeah, at Saturday. Saturday. Ten o'clock. Are you going to be there, Eric? Uh, no, I won't. Well, okay, I may so. be there at the I may be there at the beginning, but I have to. Mm -hmm. I'll have to. Well, uh, Carl, how long? He said forty five minutes. Forty five minutes. Then I probably can be there. Okay. Um, I'll I'll have to, I'll have to. I'll have to go before eleven, but I can I can be there. Well, I recommend everybody go, even though he says it's going to be easy. I'm sure it's. All these things start, but the questions are usually pertinent. So I would recommend uh, coming. What's the workshop? It's on setting and understanding the stereo window. Oh, okay. And don't forget, next month is a competition month. Club members, um, get your competition photos ready. What's the theme? The theme for next month is. Let's see, it's the David Coots, he's eating. Of, of if he wasn't year. eating, he could tell us. Nightlife. <laughs> oh, no, I couldn't. The, 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 nightlife? The, the nightlife, yes. Oh, that's my yeah. type of night. You're going to be tough what competition, what? Alicia. <laughs> what, what happened? <laughs> I said, if it's you said you'll, time, be, you'll be tough competition. Thing, you're going to be tough competition. Yeah. You're oh, going to okay. enter, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll see you, I'll, I'll be tough competition if I could figure out how to like actually upload something in, in the right format in the right time frame. So yes, perhaps <laughs> oh, I won't be. Oh, um, Eric, the uploader is really easy to use. I know, I'm just, I, I, I find out, like I remember things like two days afterwards, you know, I'm always a day late and the buck short with that stuff, but uh, cool, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, also, does anybody any, know anything uh, about the NSA? Does anybody know anything about uh, like when NSA sub? Yeah, I'm chairing oh, yeah, it. Yeah, it's are, like, August twelfth. Like, uh, it's August twelfth through fifteenth. If you go to our yeah. site, three uh, D dash com. At yeah, yeah. No, that there, like, 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 like. I, I was just wondering because, like, when I went on it, um, it was just like some uh, thing from like Melody was up, but it didn't say anything about like doing workshops or like. Uh, yeah, it'll be coming up in probably a theater. week. We'll start having the forms come up. We're a okay. little late. I'm running it, so it's a yeah, little Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I was just the sure that I didn't... Yeah, the, the webmasters finally got the website together. Mm -hmm. In fact, Steve, should should we end with the uh, the video? If you want to show it, uh, do you have it? I'll tell you what. Let me let me let me do this. Let me let me show everybody. I I don't want to force everyone to sit through a video, but what I can do is show force the website. Everybody. It, Actually, no, it'd be no, better no, to I, wait you, until the forms are up to show the video. Then people, yeah, can, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I, let me just let me just do this. The, uh, the website is coming to life, so if you go to three d dash con dot com, thank you. Um, the website has been coming together. The the introductory video is on both the website and the YouTube channel, so you can watch it there. And um, when all of the calls for submissions go live, they'll all be here in the menu. 
So, mm -hmm. um, cool. Hopefully, hopefully that'll be before the end of April. Uh, and there is currently a call for papers uh, nice. for for the the sessions on um, the history of stereoscopic photography, and then uh, workshops and theater shows. Uh, those calls for submissions will be going up very very soon. Cool. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we just have to proofread everything. We're having another meeting and uh, so we'll probably, that'll be part of next meeting. We'll have next meeting and the, uh, we'll have a competition. We'll show that video. Um, we'll the NFA also, also hopes to have the registration page for the actual convention up uh, in the near future as well. And uh, Steve, what were the dates for the convention? 12th through 15th, August. Of, of August. So we hope 2021. And, and you'll be getting LA lots 3D. of, we got a lot of goodies. If you do want to pay the registration fee, we're going to have a Viewmaster reel. We're going to have uh, 3D glasses. We're going to have uh, other, we're going to have a Pixie viewer, which is a little bigger than this. So we're running. Uh -huh thousand pixie viewers so uh, we're expecting a lot of people and uh and the the la 3d club will be the hosting club for this year's convention so we'd love to have participation from la 3d club members right eric is going to be theater manager again dave camo from the new york club so there is significant uh new york club involvement as well dave and jim harp so i don't want to neglect them uh, also from the Golden Gate Club, we have Jay Kuznets, and then we have uh, David Kuntz from our club, is a uh, treasure. David, I need you to pay the PayPal invoice to Wario tonight. Really? Yeah, I just so, sent you an email. I saw it. <laughs> so what do you say, Steve? Should we officially close out this meeting? I think uh, I'm handing yes. over the after party, yes. as they call it, to... Uh, oh, questions. Andrew, what do you have? Oh. Uh, or were you just I dancing just, well, because it's over? The, the Hollywood Star <laughs> Exhibition will be opening up October 1st to November 1st for uploads. And there are going to be four special competition categories with prizes. And I'm going to tell you what those prizes are. The pandemic category has a book from Susan Pinsky and David Starkman that they donated called Stereoscopic Drawing by Arthur Gerling. And that book, that has some value to it. I looked it up. Uh, the yeah, we still sell category, it on my website. We'll have uh, uh, two pairs of Gunner Glyph glasses were donated by Ferris and Stereo Photography Products. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And then uh, in the wildlife category, there was a lot of that last year. Uh, Barry Rothstein donated phanograms from nature. So you'll be able to, uh, that, so, and then in the modified category, we have an anonymous uh, gift from Teresa. <laughs> it's not anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> it's original Gen 13 comic book. Uh, and the 3D conversion was by Ray Zone. Oh, that's gotta be worth something. I what think category it is worth a lot, actually, but I don't know that it's signed. Teresa might tell us. What category was that in? For the modified. Maybe Ooh. I need to. I'm gonna modify, modify this tonight. <laughs> Can I enter Blender files in in the Hollywood? Uh, blend I know PSA has different rules than uh, we do. I, I think they all have to be photographic. I don't. Yeah, think I'm pretty sure they files. do. You better check on that. We could always have a non-PSA category. What I, a blender? Is that something you make smoothies with? What's a blender? <laughs> uh, yeah. right, make Com computer make graphic. Make, make yeah, just computer with graphic. It. There's right. nothing photographed. I don't, in it, nothing real. I don't right. think the the PSA exhibitions uh, have any categories for computer graphics. Well, right. screw them. And then our judges, of course, are Steve Sclair, stereographer and cinematographer, Celine Tricart. Hopefully she will be in the United States, stereographer, director, cinematographer, and VR pioneer. And Jeff Amaral, stereographer, are our 
judges. Wow. That's pretty stellar. Yeah. And a Andy, uh, we can talk about this later, but uh, yeah. we may be get, able to get some additional prizes from uh, London Stereoscopic Company. They were interested Ooh. in donating some nice. prizes as well. Uh, I'm out of categories. So I can either add categories or give them to maybe the honorable mention. Give them to the uh, winners. Can I make stuff for you guys? You could do that. Sure, yeah. Awesome. Wow, this is okay, the biggest I'm gonna... exhibition ever. What's up? I am gonna I am gonna stop the official recording. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, we'll keep this Zoom open for socializing, and uh, we'll see you back here for the next meeting on what is it May May twentieth May twentieth Great.